shaman. And I don't know exactly why I was given the explanation, and I just can't for the life of me remember it. But it's a vote for Boston taking on the big mage, big control mage, uh, the dragon priest, and peanut shaman from Viper. So hoping to get a glimpse of that one in there and uh, rolling into game number one here. Boston's going to be on even Warlock to start things off, and Viper on dragon priest. Um, I, I would tend to say that there are some scary cards in Viper's deck that can do a number on Boston's overall game plan. But I think in totality, I feel like Boston uh, has the edge here when those cards don't appear. But when they do, it can be a pretty sticky situation to deal with. Yeah, I think um, for the for the Warlock here, it's just a matter of just get a big threat down early and just try and punch him with it repeatedly. Because um, almost any type of Priest these days, because of the emission in most decks of all of the available copies of you know, Shadow of Death and even Shadow of Pain, just early minions coming down and pushing damage from turns like one through five are so valuable. And then that gets kind of expedited by this particular build like the Dragon Priest, which also emits Mass Hysteria from the deck. So their actual big powerful board clears and removal effects don't really come into play until Psychic Scream. And if we there is an 8-8 minion in play, hitting away strength. at you, you don't get to turn 7 to Psychic Scream it away. Yeah. Some some of the, the cards in Boston's hand I do like, though. I think even Warlock is one of those decks that, uh, it, when it's poor, poorly positioned in the metagame, I definitely think it struggles a lot. But when it has a good position or it has a pretty even matchup, it's got a lot of flexibility to it. So when I look at this hand from Boston, uh, I feel like there's so many key cards here, even down to just like him having Mountain Giant and the ability to Spellbreaker and opposing Twilight Acolyte if and when it shows up yep. is a pretty major deal. So I think Boston uh, is in a spot right now where it, even if he sees some of those very strong opposing cards that he has some game in this one, uh, even though we're looking at Viper's hand early, and it's pretty stacked with ways to dismantle the assault from Boston. It certainly is, yeah. There is an interesting sequence that you can play out in this matchup, um, specifically, you know, Slow Warlocks versus Priest, where you can actually throw out a Twilight Drake first with certain draws, and then when your Mountain Giant comes so down, you already have that four attack Twilight Drake consolidated on the board, which trades with the giant eight four that they make by swapping attack. And then you can say silence your mountain giant and re-dominate the board. But with even lock on coin, that curve just isn't really available to you unless you really want to pass up on pressure because on even lock on coin, you actually get to play the mountain giant a turn earlier than you can the Twilight Drake. Yeah, and not always the prettiest sight to see when something like this happens, but I feel like this is the, the risk you often just have to take when you're in Boston's position. Yep. Boston, of course, is probably the player that you might just be less familiar with out of these two. Viper, of course, does already have his birth booked to the World Championship, but Boston, no slouch in and of himself. He was, in fact, uh, top eight in HCT Italy 2018. Uh, performances like that led him to place eighth overall in the 2018 point standings, and he has made a top 16 out of previous playoffs as well. So he's a fantastic player, part of the Dusky Boys practice group, along yep. with Orange and various other players. Um, so he's in good company. He's got a good practice group around him. He's a very, very solid player. And having hung out with him at several events at this point, he's a very, very nice guy as well. Yeah, I, you know, I really have a lot of those sentiments to echo with Viper as well. You know, having the championship berth, uh, it's a little bit easier to understand uh, how, how well someone's been performing. But even just in the tour stop in Philadelphia that took place uh, late in 2018, he brought some interesting choices in some of his decks and just overall performed really well. And for the most part, was just kind of hanging out with people and talking about you know, the games and just random things they enjoy. Right. Wasn't not really a guy who I think takes it too seriously. It's that when it comes competition time, you know, it's all focused. But in between rounds, just kind of chilling out. There were one word I would use to describe Viper's play style, though. I'm going to go with methodical. He is a slow, considered individual when it comes to playing Hearthstone. Pretty much the polar opposite of what uh, Derek was talking about with Casey in the previous series. Oh, yeah. And one way isn't necessarily better than the other. Casey has this instinctual way that works for him, and you can't argue with his results. Viper, at the same time, takes his full 75 seconds. Um, a lot of the time, will probably arrive at the same play that Casey will in that in yeah. that time, but there is no harm in using the full time allotted to you if that's how you feel comfortable playing the game. Right. Uh, you know, some players, they, they just overthink it if they take too long. Yes. They'll, they'll start finding things that trick them into making worse-looking styles of play. And I think that's something you definitely should be avoiding. And Viper here taking the opportunity to just get aggressive, just pushes eight damage. I am quite surprised about the push, but 
it does make a lot of sense when I'm when I'm just looking at how the, the board lines up. You know, Boston doesn't really have a lot of interest in just trading a mountain giant over a four five, mm -hmm. and doesn't really have a lot of interest in putting his mountain giant into an eight four. And going face here just means that you're going to end up taking even more damage on top of this. So I think Boston actually just kind of got pushed into a weird spot here. I think this was a brilliant move from Viper. Yeah. The, uh, the Norsha Cleric is a nice little insurance policy here as well, because the one thing you would kind of fear in this position as Viper is the 4-3, the Spellbreaker goes into the 8-4, and then uh, Boston can pick up a value trade with the Mountain Giant and then heal it up potentially with a uh, Shroom Brewer, right? But the Norsha Cleric is a little bit of an insurance policy against that, where if it does happen, at least there is going to be a card draw going off on Viper's side. Yeah. A bit of a punishment here with the exactly second Mountain Giant and Vulgar Homunculus to... Uh, pull attention away from the 8-5 on the trade here as well. But I'm not necessarily sure that, that Boston's interested in trading. I mean, when my opponent leaves up an 8-5, I often, one of the first things that comes to my head is how much damage can I now deal that I have two Mountain Giants in play instead of just one? As a wise man called Rosti just told me very recently, you always value trade, Admirable. Well, there was a bit of a preface to it. I strongly disagree, <laughs> by the way. I, I, I honestly think, like, if you're learning the game, you should point every attack at face and then convince yourself not to attack face. I think that's a healthier way to do it. Learn when to not do yes. so. Yes, default every attack to face and then say, what is wrong with doing this? And if you can give yourself a reason why it's wrong, then take the value trade. Quite yeah. often, you will end up taking the value trade because there are a lot of things that will go wrong with going face. Now, initially, you may find yourself never backing down from it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> but you will soon learn the pitfalls of... Uh, of not ever backing down from that face attack. Yeah. Now this Mountain Giant has been consolidated. These Shroom Brewers can come into play to try and get some repeated value here out of the Mountain Giant, but they are also very powerful cards in the matchup, very powerful defensive tools for Boston because he is right down at that range where Viper does not really have to mess around with too much Shadow Reaper and win. If he starts drawing some Mind Blast, Boston is just looking kind of dead if he doesn't use those options to heal up himself. Yeah, I, I am personally myself eyeing the Dread Infernal in this spot. I think the Mountain Giant is fairly safe on board. Viper doesn't have a lot of ways to necessarily reach the Mountain Giant afterwards. He's trimmed out the Wild Pyromancers and opted for Fire Tree Witch Doctor. Uh, yeah. The caveat there is Dragon Maw Scorcher. Mm. Uh, as a single copy of in Viper's deck. You know, rolling into seven mana, I feel like you're going to have 14 attack on board. Viper's not going to have a board in play, and then you get to preserve both the Shroom Brewers. You get to buff up your Spellstone, and then you have Bone Mare and Lich King to follow it with a Blood Reaper Bull Don back behind. Feeling it. I'm marching to your beat, Admirable. Now, that being said, I'm not sure if the Mountain Giant should trade or not. My instinct tells me it should be in this spot because Boston's life total is just so precarious. Ooh. So if he's going to go this direction, it makes zero sense to be trading instead. Yes. Now you have initiated a race with your opponent and you've said, let's go. Mm -hmm. But Viper has an inclusion in his hand that answers that. This is an unusual card to be found in Viper's hand right now with the scale worm. And now that I see it, I like the line that Boston's taken here. It kind of splits the difference between the two lines we were talking about. You know, you were advocating for like developing more heavily with the Dread Infernal, but then you were kind of stuck in this position where maybe that means you're supposed to take the value trade with the Dustbreaker, whereas I was looking at just a more defensive option. Boston just split it right down the middle and gave himself a little bit of leeway with the heal and used that to entitle himself to send H damage to face. Yeah, I think that that has a lot of merit to it as well. You know, if he, if he ends up going for a value trade here, it means that Viper, as he approaches the Shadow Reaper and in turn, you have a lot more to, to worry about where that trading is concerned. It's, it basically starts a chain reaction where you are playing recovery, and Blood Reaver Gul'dan versus Alex Straza typically does not play that recovery game very well. Right. So I do like this angle uh, from Boston too, because aggressive stances just put your opponent to the test. They have to have answers to these situations. Go, uh, very efficient in this position, and both players just now refusing to blink, essentially, in terms of these base attacks. Viper, when he, <laughs> when he goes for this power word shield heal, he winces to himself a bit and then ends up with his face in his hands, just like pushing at the tear ducts, like, oh, what am I doing right now? Did I really just heal over play a 3-3? I mean, I see Hooked Reaver. 
but there's already a 4-4 four four on board. I, I found a lot of times with, with uh, even Warlock, my major goal is to get two threats online that are just actually threats. Mm -hmm. In this position for Boston, I would like to see one of the eights or the six come out in this spot. And the reason is because he, you just need to hold on to these two fours to try to create that scenario where you get two threats online. We, so we saw in the Tice versus Oskaka series, we saw Tice in this position twice neglect to play Bone Mare Lich King type things just to continue to make four fours and to play around the Shadow Reaper and Wind turn that Bosden is now going into as well. So there's something you can consider as well with, you know, Twilight Drake and Shroom Brewer or Shroom Brewer to heal yourself back up first and then put Freebrewer as a 4 4, which is the kind of play that um, that Tice ended up making. But then, like you said, there's also just the threat of ignoring Shadow Reaper Anduin and just coining out one of the big eights. But then also, that coin is very valuable to Bosden with Blood Reaver Gul'dan in hand, especially in this matchup, because if the Shadow Reaper Anduin is to come down, then there is like so much threat of just pings taking him out here if Boston can't quickly coin out that Blood Reaver. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason that he goes for the Dread Infernal instead, is if he sees uh, Shadowy Brando in this spot, you get the two fours to back that up, and then you get to coin into Blood Reaver Gul'dan and the Dread Infernal returns to play. Right. Yeah, I mean, if Shadowy Brando comes down even, you can just like slam Lich King on the following turn and then yeah. coin Gul'dan after that, having already seen like the best Lich King removal in Viper's deck already gone if Shadowy Brando were to come. Yeah, the second best would be, of course, the uh, Twilight Acolyte and then Cabal Shadow Priest, the Nightmare. True. Uh, but I think either way, Boston is setting himself up for the kind of position oh, that quickly. you need to win as even Warlock in this matchup. Ooh. Just kind of a weird, clunky game plan that you play until things fall in place. Viper's Control Priest. It's going to struggle in a lot of these spots. It's very specific answers for very specific things. Well, that is now both Twilight Acolytes used. Ooh, did he not get the ooze down, or did he intentionally not play the ooze? I can't he... imagine he doesn't want an ooze in play there, right? So then it's missed? It has the to timer? be. <sighs> I don't... What's, what's the logic on just skipping on the 3-3 three -three that turn? What, what benefit does it give you? Twilight Drake buff, an activation of Shadow Reaper Anduin down the road. Uh, so many three mana cards aren't ability. really that high in equity for like yeah. Shadow Reaper Anduin activations, though. It's like the two and below that you're really looking at. I can see the Twilight Drake arg argument, but I mean, do you want plus one health or do you want, well, like, do you want one stat or six stats? Uh, I want more. More is better. <laughs> more is just more. I like Mora. Mm -hmm. Give me some Mora. <laughs> Wait, that's me. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. Maybe you didn't. No. Oh. Get out my brain. Next level thinking. And also my bushes. I see you at night. I think not seeing the Shadow Reaper into in last turn, Boston can be quite com confident that it is not in the hand. Yes. I wonder. And again, like he doesn't really have to play around it this turn because even if Shadow Reaper Anduin were to come down here, the board gets cleared. Like the 6 4 doesn't just stick around, it gets cleared out as well. And then he has that coin gold arm we've been talking about. Yep. Like it's not even really a bad Anduin for him to take in this spot. He's preserved uh, nine healing in here as well with the Shroom Brewer and the Spellstone. Bosn looking in really good shape. Yeah. And how much of it is just Viper looking in particularly bad shape? He just really, he's, he's been way too reactive for this matchup. Or not, I, sorry, that's bad phrasing. I'm not to say he's playing too reactive for this matchup. His hand and his draw has been go. far too reactive I was for like, this whoa. matchup. I was like, really? I feel like Viper's kind of, you know, turning up the heat a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's, he's doing I the see, best see, with the yeah. ingredients he's been given. He just hasn't had the proactive start that he needed. Past that point where he, he uh, snatched the A attack off the Mountain Giant and made a push. Once that was gone, he just really didn't have the gas to keep going, or although maybe a more aggressive use of that gluttonous ooze would have helped him. Now, the Gul'dan doesn't really get much back in this spot because the Infernal got screamed away. It's yep. a vulgar homunculus? Yeah, I think that's about it. I don't see a copy of Master Spell, or really any silence for that matter. If I'm in Boston's spot, I am really eyeing these two... Uh, these two Twilight Drakes. Pitiful 
I'm somewhat interested by that over the Drakes. Mm. I agree. I suppose a weird route to victory would be Viper has two Mind Blasts and Witch Doctors into a third one. Sure. So many possibilities. I think if you put yourself in Boston's shoes as well, like he's envisioning a very weird, scrappy hand on Viper's yeah. side based on what the last few plays have been. That's an excellent point as well. I mean, you know, Viper just ha has been hanging on to cards for a while. Yeah. And if this is good enough to get the Psychic Scream, you know, a second one, perhaps. Why not? I must consider. Is someone injured? There's also the argument to say, like, just getting down this 7-7 seven, seven again, like, that gives Boston more incentive to be playing Gul'dan quicker, which is something that he wants to do, right? Yeah. Like, uh, if Twilight Drakes get killed, then they get killed. If a 7-7 seven, seven gets killed, then he can just happily, more happily just jam his Gul'dan, which is really where you want to be in the matchup and actually get a bigger reward out of it. Viper's looking exhausted. I mean, it's been a pretty long day here, thanks, uh, you know, partially to, to round number one, which you and I cast. Yeah, we just did not cast that game quick enough. We, we, yeah. should, have, we should have sped it up. <laughs> Fun fact, that, uh, that first match now holds the record in European playoffs for the longest and second longest games. Yes that have taken place. It, in fact, broke the record twice in the second to last game, which was then outdone by a distance, by like another 10 <laughs> minutes by that insane last Warrior versus uh, Priest game. Going back to that as well, like uh, towards the end of that game, I was kind of egging Hunter Ace on to concede because I was just saying he was like mathematically dead. Hunter Ace actually spoke afterwards and said that he thought he was actually close to the turn timer that, right. that, that would force a draw in the game client, although we have rules in place in the tournament uh, to de uh, declare a winner in that. And then when we went back and kind of thought it out, like, yeah, he was in the 40 plus turns at the end of that game yep. when it got down to it. Absolutely crazy. If you missed that, do go back and watch it. Although probably hit like 4x speed on the Twitch player, <laughs> just, just for your own peace of mind. Yeah, but then yeah. you'll only be there for an hour. Yes. We're not kidding. And you Boston, will be there for an hour. Boston turns up the heat this turn, and rightfully so, uh, given the position that, you know, Viper, again, has been floundering around in this game, not really anything happening. And now the hand's getting forced. Had some of the key cards early, but Boston had the double mountain giant and a significant amount of healing to back up the uh, the life taps and the damage that he was taking on the backswing as a result. Yep. I must consider. Also worth addressing, we haven't really uh, covered it. Boston taking what we're calling a pair down in this round as a 4-0 nice. going up against a 3-1, which is not something that you really want to see. You know, we say in Swiss rounds, you will be matched up to, with someone with a same or similar record. You really want that same. You don't want the similar a lot of the yeah. time, unless you're on Viper's side where you're being paired up because essentially in, in very, very layman's terms, the better the record of the people you are defeating, the better for you. Yes. Boston, though, you know, moving into a 5-0 position here, I think you're pretty okay with that. We'll take it, yeah. But definitely a crucial, I'd say, a technically more crucial match for Viper than it is for Boston. You know, Viper losing at this stage puts him at a very deep risk of not being able to make the top eight cut. For Boston taking that loss, well, you're in a bit of trouble, but you still got your hopes alive. Well, yeah, suddenly there's there's 10 damage. Suddenly there's a fire tree, Witch Doctor. Suddenly none of these cards deal damage. You're staring down at seven across the way as well. You happen to be at seven. You got to do something. But what is that something? Ooh, yeah. Bootleg ice block, as you put it earlier. <laughs> It's a tenuous link at best, but I stand Kinda by it. Kinda don't die this turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dr 
Dread Infernal back from the depths of the deck after, I believe, originally being Psychic Screamed away. Yep. I'm, I'm a bit more interested in this Lich King at this point. I mean, same. your opponent did just fire Tree Witch Doctor. There is a bit of a risk where the, uh, you know, a big mind control or a shadow or death is concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm also just down for some Gul'dan. Oh. Hmm. I'm sold. I feel like at this point, like, Bosdom feels comfortable. He's not going to die to any burst combination, especially after he just saw a Holy Fire get used. So then you start to get in your own head about what this spell from the Fire Tree Watch Doctor could be. And I think the best play where you don't really have to worry about any of them is Gul'dan over either of the other minions, where suddenly, you know, different things like Seance and Mind Control and all kind of nonsense can start to make an impact on the game. Yeah. Now, it does put him in a spot where this represents, again, uh, lethal to Viper, and so action has to be taken. Was that not the case with Blood Reaver Gul'dan? With Blood Reaver Gul'dan, he gets a 2 4 in play, and so. Uh, he doesn't get. The Hooked Reaver didn't die? Did it get screamed again? I think. I believe the Hooked Reaver got okay. screamed, did not. Okay. I was working on the assumption that there was a 4 4 coming out of it as well, so that makes more sense. I'm pretty sure it got screamed. I believe you. I am not sure I believe me, though. <laughs> Have some confidence, Admirable. Oh, there's plenty of that. You are a smart and beautiful man, and you should believe in yourself. I'll say a third of that's true. I'll work out which third and get back to you. <laughs> So Boston's play actually worked out pretty well for him because Viper did really bite on the mind control, which then Boston snaps the Lich King into it, which suggests a little bit that maybe he had thought that through and had got in inside his own head as to what this Fire Tree Witch Doctor card could be and just decided if it was mind control, then he had just a perfectly reasonable setup against that anyway. Yeah, the issue here is that this play is still very strong on Viper's side. He gets to set up uh, again to stay alive in this position. You know, the real problem is that Viper's running out of gas, but the position is still quite strong for him, I'd say is one of the big issues here. And Boston with an interesting opportunity here too, something you very rarely see out of the, uh, the even Warlock side, which is the ability to tap coin Blood Reaver Gul'dan <laughs> and set yourself to 15 with Hooked Reaver in hand. I've only encountered this one time in all of my even Warlock play where I've had coin this long and literally drawn into Hooked Reaver. Yeah, you do it, right? To be able to tap to 15 yeah. and Blood Reaver Gul'dan. It's kind of a big deal. Boston picked up Blood Reaver Gul'dan to play it there immediately. One of the issues, again, is just, if you think about the way that Viper's hands panned out, there still could be two Mind Blasts, or a Shadow or Visions and a Mind Blast, or, or what have you. Just ways that you could just randomly kind of almost die to stuff. Yeah, but you'd be at 20. 20 is fine. For now. Yeah. Now doesn't last too much longer. Like, That's Bo true. Boston's trying to kill okay. Viper here. He's not playing defense. I'll give you. I'll give you that. For now. <laughs> That's a very true story. But I'm quite interested in this. In this Drake, sometimes trading off. Now the reason I don't like it trading off is again you just represent pressure to your opponent. They're the ones playing defense. But I think you're in a good enough spot to do this. And to me, that's a very important facet. Let me change. Boston in the end does catch on with the uh, life tap first. Obviously, it's a big deal. If it's the point isn't clear to anyone at home, it's if you life tap. Um, if you don't life tap, you get armor and on top of your health total, and then you start to continue healing up. So it's very difficult to get them below uh, 17. Whereas if you life tap first, you get that perfect 15 number. You stack the armor on top of that. You get your big 7-7 seven, seven to play out at will before you then heal up afterwards. Yeah, and to me, this is looking like a, uh, you know, you search for defile. It's probably not there. Do pack hook driver shift the turn. This has been a very interesting technical game of the, the back and forth that's been taking place. It has. Does he have to do impact two? So I don't think he, he has to. Snipe the 3-3. Three, three. Uh, well, hook Dreaver first, snipe the 3-3, three, three, and then uh, just add another Shroom Brewer or something to that. Because the 7-7 seven, seven still isn't being challenged by what you leave on the board there. You're still, like, threatening lethal on the following turn. I must feed now. 
My hunger grows. It, they just mean different things. Like they do. Yeah. Varyingly tiny, somewhat Before annoying different things. Oh, this is interesting. So something else to consider is that if Shadowy Branduin hits on your 7-7 seven, seven taunt while well, there's this much pressure on the other side of the board, you don't really have anything else you can do about it. In this situation, if Viper Shadowy Branduin's pushes for six, you can follow with the Hooked Reaver afterwards. Because the face attacks would take you back yeah. down into range. Yeah. Okay. And you don't lose your defensive measure as a result of that either, mm. the Hooked Reaver. I think they both play out fairly similarly, but this one mm. utilizes Gen Greymane and Sunfury Protector, two pretty darn weak cards at this stage. And you preserve Hooked Reaver, a potentially very strong card at this stage. There might just be just a, a divergence in me mentality here between myself and Boston because. I'm still focused on trying to kill my opponent in his mm. position, in which case I don't want to be using my weak cards. I want to be just keeping my foot on the gas and just doing the most powerful things I can on any given turn. I mean, when I get Blood Reaver Gul'dan, I tend to do that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, three damage a turn plus you refund three of your own health. Yeah. It adds up very quickly. There's not a lot of healing left in Viper's deck. O Odd Hunters do very, very dumb things to their deck to deal three damage mm. per turn to your face. Yes, and when you're playing a deck that doesn't you know, present any aggression, it often works. Yeah. The problem is a single flame imp will dismantle your entire strategy. Yes. No. It's looking like defensive Alex, yeah. And this is something that I feel like Boston has just opened himself to. He he created a board that was challenged by what he saw, as opposed to a board that wasn't. The, the, the two health differential between the 6-5 that he played and the 7-7 seven, seven that he could have played has just allowed Viper to just take control of the board. Ah, you trade off the do pack on this card away. I was like, there's, I was like, he's, he's not seriously considered fighting this on your footing. <laughs> I was like, this is... And now that you've seen the Alexstrasza go away, Boston is free to heal himself basically as much as possible. Yeah. So I like this. Hero power and nothing. Don't play the vulgar homunculus because you still have a Spellstone left in your deck. But now Viper hey. finds Shadow Reaper Anduin. Can he crank out enough damage in time? I mean, I'm like two Mind Blast Shadow Visions. 14 in a single turn? How yeah, does he keep this chain he's going? Struck, right, that, that's the problem is that he cannot, he cannot keep lowering Boston's health total over a number of turns without using these Mind yeah, Blast and Shadow Visions. Just three a turn, yeah, uh, net. Yeah, Boston's just netting, exactly. So Viper has to find a way to either stick a minion on boards to get some attacks through, or he needs to find like stacks on stacks of Mind Blasts and damage. Which the stacks on stacks of Mind Blasts, you know, probably not happening this game. There's one Witch Doctor left. There's another Fire Tree, yeah. In terms of minion presence, what does he have? He has Crowd Roaster I don't think we've seen yet. Pair Drakes. Okay. So he has some pretty tricky to remove stuff still hanging around. I think that's where Boston's head's at too. How much do you commit if you see Primordial Drake? Right. And it's only one or two attacks that he's going to need from a four attack minion to really make the difference here. My hunger. I feel like this is a window I Boston has left himself open though. Now. By just slow playing a, a little bit on the last couple of turns. I feel like he still gets there. Again, if Viper spent... Oh, I do too. I think he's still heavily favored. With, with Viper having three hero powers a turn and spending all 10 mana, Boston's taking net three damage a turn. Yeah. And that makes those two Mind Blasts look like they're light years away. Yeah. I think it just was presented the opportunity to kind of get it done this way. And it's working. Oh, it's actually oh. the only spell left. Okay. So until he draws the Shadow Visions, he's in business. Machines in terms of win. Yeah, exactly. Until that copy of Shadow Visions comes out of his deck, he can get some damage going. With only five cards left, though. That percentage increases uh, pretty rapidly. It does. So many bloody decisions. Pitiful mortal. Well, regardless, it does look like Boston is just putting the finishing touches on this yeah. game. He's found his way all the way back up to 30 now. 
And Viper with his Alex Straza already gone, and with just a, a couple of little handful of ragtag dragons left to play, and a couple of mind blasts for I'm his just, name. I'm just personally upset at Hook Dreaver calling us pitiful mortals, and he's just a 4 4. Yeah. I feel like. Freaking delusions of grandeur yeah, over there. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I'd take that from a 7 7, but a 4 4? What's even the point? Yeah. Who am I kidding? I wouldn't take that from a 7 7 either. <laughs> My hunger grows. If it's not Lich King sized, Saddle doesn't care. Yeah. And honestly, like this, this is why I mentioned like a, a divergence in mentality when I started to like disagree with the lines that Boston was taking because his line wins. That's clear from like the way that the game has played out. Yeah. But he's put himself in a position where he's just killing everything the Viper is playing, and he's healed himself back up to thirty. Uh, a different line may have killed Viper quicker. They both win the game. You don't get a medal for winning quicker. Yeah, as TJ always say, it says that I say two roads to El Paso. The actual saying is, two roads to El Dorado, the city of gold. Isn't it actually multiple roads to El Dorado? It's the same thing. The idea is that it's two different lines. Yeah. You know the two roads. I mean, there's plenty of roads to El Dorado as far as, you know, I think the legend says. It's like, everywhere technically goes there. If everywhere goes there, how can it be hidden? That's, that doesn't make any sense. Well, you have to be able to, to you know, rummage through that path, really. You have to be able to, like, read the right signs and things like that. Uh-huh. Like a, like a like a game of Hearthstone. You have to be able to read your opponent's hand. So it's not on Google Maps, is what you're saying? Correct. Right. Not that I've seen, anyway. And believe me, I've scoured the entire Earth looking for it. <laughs> Darkness. The, thing, the things you've seen on Street View. It took me 12 real-time years, like that roller coaster that guy built. Right. In that roller coaster tycoon game. Mm -hmm. Let me Not an ideal target. Mind. No, it's cute. It is a it is a play that has upside, as weird as it looks. Not really in this situation, but it's something that you can do in some spots so that you get the turn of tempo initiative that a Doomsayer grants when your opponent does not. But uh, yeah, not not really going to matter a great deal in this situation. Yeah, not quite the matchup that Viper was looking for in this one, and not able to snag a win out of this one. A couple of. Uh, you know, a pair of his other decks may look a lot better in this situation. I think he got the uh, short end of the stick where this one was concerned. But does draw a dragon. Can Fire Tree Witch Doctor ever get out of this? The answer is no. 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 I can't even Darkness think of a priest spell here that's... Me. That does anything. To me, it's just funny that Viper is calculating this prior to even seeing the Witch Doctor. Right. And this is often like a, a specific thing that um, I have done to help myself is I try to, to visualize what the clear picture is. So if I'm faced with two of the decisions that make a difference and both make sense, I have a more clear image of which one to take in that scenario. Yeah, and he goes through the motions. If in doubt, open some boxes and see what happens. But there was nothing in the boxes for Viper except disappointment. Sure does. 5-0 is a lofty perch to fall from. And I'm looking at this shaman hand from Viper. And Saddle, that means we're in for a treat. As he very give me this deck list. Semi-violently swipes the deck list yeah. from a resting spot on the desk. I'm just gonna dispassionately name some cards in this deck. Give give it to me. Lay it on me. Electra Storm Surge. Zentimo. Lone Champion. Haunting Visions, Elise the Trailblazer. Let me get into Battlecry territory. There's Dragonmore Scorchers, there's Primordial Drakes, there's Hagatha, and then as we mentioned before, there's that Shudderwalk to just bring it all back at the end and just wipe more boards as we get further into the game. So it is just a phenomenal anti-aggro deck, but against a more uh, late game focused or mid rangey deck, does it have the punching power to keep a bigger board clear consistently? If you're asking me a question about this deck, what I can tell you is the deck list and what they call it. <laughs> I give you, I will give you my name, number, and rank, and nothing more. <laughs> I, 
I mean, the hand looks pretty good right now. It does. And I think, honestly, this matchup is a good test for it to, you know, find some kind of place in my estimations because this is the exact kind of mid-rangey build a big sticky board kind of deck that can, in my mind, give this some troubles. Never Whoa. mind. I forgot Shaman can just draw. Never mind. <laughs> I forgot Shaman can just draw Keliseth on two, and then everything's fine. That is definitely a, a super powerful card. I don't think there's much question about that. And that being said, there's not really a ton of minions in this deck. You know, you're looking at spells, a pair of Earthshocks, a Haunting Visions, two Healing Rains, two Hexes, two Tidal Surges, two Volcanoes, a Rain of Toads, and a Hagatha. There's no Zoo deck out there that's playing like you know, 17 spells right. in the deck. That's just not how it works. I think Kellis is in there just because there was no other two-cost Shaman card that had a battle cry that healed or dealt damage. Right. I mean, there's some stuff. There's Stone Hills, there's Intimo, there's Electra, there's those Primordial Drakes we were talking about, Elise, Dragonmore. Like, there's, there's some things that benefit from being buffed, for sure. But yeah, it is a very, very spell-heavy deck. It's typically how minions work. As Raven always says, that Saddle says, having plus one, plus one to your entire deck is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I filled my quota of quoting other people, quoting other people for the day. Quote the Raven, never more. Viper just looks uncomfortable. He really? Just, he just sat there shaking his head like something has gone wrong. I'm not seeing it. I mean, it's what, what's going wrong here? This looks great. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to divine what would go wrong with a deck like this when you don't have the baseline of what going right looks like in the first place. True story. So it's, you know, Viper will feel like he has a lot to prove with this. You know, he's gone to a three and one record with this deck in his lineup, and I'm assuming it hasn't been getting banned too regularly. So he's been picking up wins with it. But, you know, this is a deck he tweeted about. He said it was great. You know, they've, they've given it kind of that, that Peanut Shaman nickname because they think it's extremely powerful. Uh, against the field, so he will be feeling like he has a lot to prove with this deck's performance, as much as a, a one-off game sample size can really prove anything. That lone champion, something about him is just so handsome. <laughs> I can't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, it's him and Dark Iron Dwarf, I think, just two of the best-looking cards in Hearthstone. You said it, brother. Yeah. Interested in the trade in the Leoc over the 2-1 last turn. And I'll tell you what, Hunter does not really let your life total just sit there and wait to the late game. It pretty much starts to do this early on and continues to do so it's the moment you can't kill their minions. Yes. There are two healing rains hanging around that Viper can use to recover later on, but that Deathstalker Rexar is going to be the big question for me. Like, can this deck... Is it one of those decks that just concedes to Deathstalker Rexar? That's my question, because does it have a win condition? Like, how, how does it win the game if not just through attrition? Well, something else I'm looking at, too, is just, you know, the steady shot is actually a big deal. You know, there's a there's a master's call already in Boston's hand. Sure. But there's, you know, there's not really a shortage of pressure that's happening from, from Boston's side. I think ke keeping the steady shot around has a lot of merit as well. I agree. For some time, he can do so if he, if he would like to, especially because, you know, ideally he'd like to get Zentimo going first and then switch to Deathstalker Corrector afterwards if he's going to go that route. Um, and for the time being, yeah, until he's out of pressure, the two damage from the hero power might end up being more beneficial against what is already looking like a very, very slow deck from Viper's side. I wonder. This just looks like a really good arena deck right now. <laughs> like a really good one. I'm very proud of it. If this is, eh. if this is the 30 I've put together. Nine wins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like you're making a profit on well, your gold. It's true. Saying, it's like, true. Wonder. Have you seen some of the decks that Crit plays against? It's got <laughs> nothing on those. You would think that there'd be a, like a a market cap on flame strikes at a certain point. Yeah. 
That joke's like three years out of well, date at I, this point. It's, but, we've been yeah, doing all day is three-year-old jokes. I know, I know. That's been the theme. It's TJ and Frodan's fault. They set the trend. I'm just a follower. Volcano number one ripped from Viper. There's no storms in here if I'm reading it right. right? No, there is not. So yeah, they, even the, the mass removal that doesn't come from uh, minion battle cries is actually quite limited when it gets down to it. I'm curious if seeing that volcano ever prompts Boston to uh, get it with a Tundra Rhino here. I mean, Tundra Rhino's pretty darn scary when it sticks to the board and Viper's rolling into a four plus coin turn. There's a lot of business for it still remaining. Like, Earthshocks would be a fine answer for Viper, but definitely not the end of the world from Boston's perspective. But there's the two hexes as well. What other potential answers are there in the deck? Not too many, actually. See, I wouldn't hate it. It is really tough to pass up another Master's Call. Also with a hand this week, though. Quickly. See, to me, Master's Call is a card that I play similarly to how uh, we used to play Sprint in Rogue when it was briefly supplanted Gadgetan Auctioneer as the card draw engine in uh, Oil Rogue, for example. Yeah. I think a lot of people played Sprint quite badly in that deck. Um, what uh, various rogue players taught me to do is to basically use every other card in my hand and then cast Sprint when I had nothing else to spend my mana on. That's what I generally try to do with Master's Call as well. Same. Tundra Rhino just feels like one of those cards that I, I, I love when it's a tempo play because it feels so powerful. It prompts something for my opponent. And yes. when they can't, it's just so massively powerful. Yes. But it's a one of in the deck. And so having that go away, I go... I've lost some of my comfort. This was my thing that ends you, the game so many times. Let me see if I can sway you here. You know what else historically have been one-offs in decks? Fandral Staghelm and Emperor Thorasan. How big a fan were you of just slamming those on curve? Look, I don't need your logic, all right? <laughs> how much health did those things have? And how often did they live? And how often did your opponent have to make horrible plays to clear them that made you happy anyway? Am I getting there? I'll buy on it. All right. Sold to the beautiful man with the beard. Third of that's correct. <laughs> man? <laughs> correct. Nice. Well, I guess the beard part's correct. Oh, you got two out of three. It's not bad. All right. I wonder. Viper has held on to this coin for dear life to get this Hagatha down. As the trumpet sound. Trumpet horn? It's just a horn, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't sound much like a trumpet. Also, as we learned from the previous series, when there are frogs involved, look out for stray lethals. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those two one ones just it's death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. You wanted to take some kind of board resilience there, I guess, because of the Ooh. I'm really surprised by that over the hero power. I I'm borderline speechless. Wow, that that was like twenty percent of the remaining health for Viper. I don't I am not familiar with Viper's deck list here, but immediately I am th I'm thinking of Three cards that playing that extra 2-2 was very, very bad again. Yes. Agatha being one of them, two copies of Primordial Drake being the other two. That That is, you know, quite odd to me. But, you know, that's that's part of the benefit I think Viper gets with a decklist like this is that facet of unfamiliarity. You know, players are not allowed to take notes. It's an open decklist format, but you have to remember all that right. heading into the game. Now, to me, the big signal is just that Viper has... Put in quite a amount of work just saving coin for as long as he had. So I feel like if I'm playing against this deck list, something that really sticks out to me is two Primordial Drake and Hagatha in the deck. Seven yep. mana plus coin means board wipe happening. Yes. And Boston does pick up a full grip here with the secrets on the follow-up. Uh, you could maybe present the argument that he's trying to keep hand space, uh, but there's no issue with the hand space. If he makes this play on the on that this turn anyway, he goes up to 10 cards off the draw, does not burn any of the secrets, and then gets to play one of the secrets and go down to nine. He's perfectly fine with that scavenging hyena still hanging around in his hand. 
if the play from Viper ends up being the Primordial Drake and not the Hagatha, having the Hyena in hand allows him to go like Hyena, Spring Paw, Hunter's Mark, push through, buff up the boy, threaten Path lethal. Dimly lit. Give him the business. 5 9 Primordial Drake's given some business to Title Surge found. Why is Agatha. it a 5 9? Why have I never seen a Keliseth Primordial Drake before? Well, I can tell you why. <laughs> It just looks weird as you've, a five nine. You've forgotten about the insanely popular peanut shaman. Mm -hmm. It's all the rage in this tournament so far. I feel like if Viper's able to put up a strong performance just in general in this tournament, you know, three ones respectable as it is. But if this continues to trend his direction, I think we may be looking at a new shaman deck. We'll wait and see. And I'll agree with you. It does look strange as a five nine. Shout out to whoever made that a 4-8. Yeah. 4-8 was perfect. It's just right. Yeah. The Lone Hunter's Mark and Viper looks away and rolls his eyes. Deathstalker Rexar looking to push the extra one instead of trading with the Diamo and foregoes Steady Shot. I feel like this would be like six damage. Instead looking steady shot. for instant Builder Beast. There's a lot of Steady Shot damage that's been missed so far. There is. But I'm kind of happy that the game has broken down to this point because this really is the question that I kind of want answered from the deck. You know, this is a learning experience for me as much as it is for anyone else. Centimo with Tidal Surge or Electra with Reign of Frogs. Electra with Reign of Frogs is basically a full spreading play. Fair. And this starts to answer the question I was leading into, which is it's all, it's all well and good stabilizing and answering threats and then picking up some spells off Hagatha to heal you up and you survive. But, you know, Deathstalker Rexar is just one of the ultimate inevitable victory cards when it comes down to a deck that doesn't really do anything. And Viper very quickly said, hey, shut up, Soddle. I'm about to do something. And very, very quickly did something strong and powerful. That is massive. Yeah. I, I never even really thought about this. Mm -hmm. And seeing it happen, it's like, oh, that's a lot of stuff. That's also a lot of stuff. Yeah, but three threes versus two fours is not exactly a deal I'm sold on. No. Three threes versus two fours with an explosive trap in play as well. It starts to get a little bit more spicy. I would be surprised if Viper had some interest in going face here. This is one of those spots where you go, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait a little bit. I'll just take my four mana this turn and just have a good old time. Yeah. Um, Cryostasis is not like the worst thing in the world here though. I mean, freezing up one of your own minions just to make it bigger. Yeah, when it has Taunt, like who needs to attack with it? Especially yeah. when there's all these traps disincentivizing the attacks in the first place. A path dimly lit. I would definitely think it quite strange for Boston to, uh, you know, have gone forward to the freezing trap in this position. I think freezing Electra is definitely one of the priorities of not doing in the matchup. Okay. So I think Viper can rule that secret out pretty quickly. And then figure the rest out from there. I am curious about the Zentimo Electra spell combination. When Electra copies the spell, does the Zentimo also make it target the adjacent minions? No, because Electra casts the second copy of the spell, and Zentimo says when you cast a spell would be my guess, but I haven't ever tested that interaction. There's the boy. We already got the the main boy in play, though. I mean, this is, this is the one that you that you said you were concerned with, is can Viper Shaman handle this? Yeah. Obviously, like I said, you know, I'm just learning as we go like everyone else is, but this is the big question that I, I just want an answer to. Like, what what can this deck do against Deathstalker Rexar? Because if you're, if you're going to play a deck in this meta game, surely you have to have an answer for Deathstalker Rexar, right? If you believe a deck to be the nuts. I would, I would think so. Yeah. My opinion uh, coming into the tournament was that I personally somewhat felt that not banning Hunter was somewhat foolish. Mm -hmm. It is just such a powerful deck. I feel like so many times you're just giving away a win by leaving Hunter up. 
Uh, God, just go ahead and take that one. It's so powerful. And the way the tournament lives are built, they're, they're typically meant to take advantage of one specific thing. And as a result, Hunter gets even stronger in those scenarios. I think it's fine to have some of those matches where you know you're giving away a substantial edge yeah. in order to have a substantial edge somewhere else. But typically that means you get to still have a chance to win against some of the decks. I feel like the edges you give up against Hunter oftentimes are quite massive. That being said, I think Viper's having a pretty solid game happening for him. But things are starting to fall apart a bit. Boston's getting some great Build-A-Beasts, and that's adding a lot of pressure. Hmm. Ooh. Something to do. Yeah, Lightning Bolt is a big deal. Yeah, knows there's no Rat Trap on the other side for Boston. So free, you just keep chaining spells. That was the Atomic Mine. Most likely be thrown into the Aether at some point just to make some hand space that you quite often run into. Um, but now, looking at Boston dwindle down into his five last remaining draws, now perhaps the win condition for Viper against the Deathstalker Rexar does become uh, quite apparent. He's just going to outlast it. I would say that's the play. There's still a copy of Dire Frenzy in Boston's deck, so that'll give him three extra turns, mm -hmm. plus the uh, the benefit of the big minion that comes in. I mean, to me, it's quite clear the game plan for Viper is run your opponent out of cards. I mean, right. it's kill all of their things and slap them around with your last generic remaining minion. That takes a long time. Boston going really deep on this choice. I would imagine his charge versus Echo Rush. Ends up Echo Rush, as I would expect, is one of the most powerful options. Or at least it's a it's a good solid B tier option. Let's put it that way. I think it's great when you're out of cards. Yeah. When your hand is freezing trap, venom strike trap, one one with rush. Yeah. Fiber just continues to Yep. Like, seemingly roll is every single time Boston has a good turn, he's like rolling his eyes at it. <laughs> he's having some pretty darn good turns himself. You know, I'm wondering where this game would have ended up if Boston had just kept steady shot. It's a great question. It's a lot of damage that was given up for that. It was. Viper has rolled a lot of times off Hagatha, though, so I'm not sure exactly what the odds are on the healing cards right now. I believe it was 32 possible spells prior to this expansion. Um, so Healing Rain specifically, for example, was a 1 in 32, but then you had you also have other options to heal. Um, now will be slightly wider odds than that, but um, you know, you'd know you expect when you, you're on your 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th minion that you're playing here as Viper is that some healing might have been picked up. Found the one title surge. Mm -hmm. Still two natural title surges in the deck. Just going to go ahead and cryostasis. Still two natural healing rings in the deck as well. Yeah, there's still a lot of healing in the deck for Viper. And maybe that's where the eye rolls are coming in. Like, you're getting this and I still can't <laughs> find a healing card? I don't think Viper has to be too concerned about healing, really, in the immediate. The one Tundra Rhino is gone. So the yeah. big, like, you know, Tundra Rhino into a ridiculous Builder Beast or Tundra Rhino Spellstone coming out, like, that's just not going to happen. If there's going to be a Tundra Rhino. It has to come from the Builder Beast itself and, it, and then ends up usually being extremely expensive. Uh, so you want to get stealth on it a lot of the time and then it's a two-turn setup and Viper has counterplay to that still with the remaining Volcano that he has in hand. Looks Boston. like it might just be coming together for Viper, you know? Yeah, Boston does not look happy with this result, leading me to believe that Bloatbat was taken on the first one. <laughs> the way that he just looked when these three minions came out of the second window. Mm. Yeah. Not quite as planned. Still, 6 3 stealth. Um, with the Death Rattle, does put it in a pretty decent position against the way the board is shaped up right now. I knew I should have kept track of these battle cries. A Firefly, a Keliseth, a Primordial Drake, a Hagatha, a Gluttonous Ooze, two 
Ember Moss Scorchers, Dragon Moss Scorchers. Dragon Moss Scorcher, me. yeah. Hmm. Electra. That's Electra. The one I was missing. Yeah. Same. Secrets worn down. I got more. I must decide. Is he other mighting? Yes, he is. Okay, I can see this. Oh, he can actually frost shock the. Uh... The Imp Master. Oh, this big breathe. bad voodoo off this as well. Wow, That's this is a clear sky. Huge push from Viper. Wow. Off the Zentimo. Well yeah, that sounds about right to me. Whoa. Austin's going to have to find some magic with this Dire Frenzy. He's going to make anything happen here. Right now, he's just going through the Spell Stone, which delays his ability to build a huge beast by one more turn, which then delays his ability to get that Dire Frenzy down by one more turn. It's just presenting another problem for Viper, though. But he's pretty much got that handle, it looks like. Shadow Walk in hand, I don't think any board state that Boston can make can be a problem in the immediacy. There's just too many clearing battle cries in there. It has to be a board and then another board and then another board after that. This kind of goes back to the Tundra Rhino now. Damn it, this deck works! What the hell? Complexing. Just blows up everything. Yeah. It's the blow up everything, Shaman. It's just Old Warrior, but the cards are a different color. And there's not piles of armor. So just piles of goofy looking stuff that seems to be working. Perplexing. Yes, indeed. Perplexing. I'm plum surprised. I feel like the Hearthstone heroes have got much more apt in their analysis recently. True story. I must decide. Again. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you must. Just spot on. Yeah. I don't well, know what that's about. That's pretty well lit right now. I yeah, mean, I can see the board. It didn't ask you to editorialize. <laughs> this whole board's going to die again. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to try and call exactly what's going to happen, but with some form of confidence, I suggest that this board is going bye-bye. Oh, there was the lone champion in there that we didn't recap as oh, well. Look, the resummon from the Big Bad Voodoo. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't even Aww. see what that was. Kept a 3-1, though. And there you go, yes. In the end, Totemic Might does get tossed away. Of course, it ends up proccing twice because the Electra Battle Cry was recycled from the Shadow Walk there, and the next spell that he cast was that Totemic Might that he just wanted to get out of his hand. Admirable is just looking on in, in like the most mystified glare on his face. <laughs> what is happening? Like I do it killed everything. But I just don't I'm what I'm wondering why it works. Like it's working, and I don't it's I'm having trouble grasping what's happening in its entirety. Why are generic shaman removal cards? Not even that, like most of these were generic neutral removal cards. Primordial Drakes and Dragon Ball Scorchers. It's working, I yeah. don't get it. Yeah. It's just kind of weird. It's not even fully stabilized yet. Like, there's still more that Viper has to do. There is, yeah. I imagine, of course, getting that Elise down at some point uh, can be hugely beneficial in a matchup like this for Viper as well, like before the Shadow Walk, the Shadow Walk comes down, because then you start to get multiple packs rocking in your deck, and then that gives you more proactive things to do, which then recycle into more spells with the Hagatha. Wow. Double Earthshock. It's going to rip the Hex here with the Zentimo instead. 
Double Hex going to pick up the two beasties off the board. I am a bit surprised by that as well, with the double Earthshock and the Ancestral being able to protect the minions. Mm -hmm. Oh, it wouldn't actually kill the 3-3. Three -three. That's why. Was four damage missing here from Boston? Is that it? I mean, Dire Frenzy represents three of that immediately. Yeah. I'm looking at... I guess he just pushes damage, right? He just has to. What other option does he have? Well, I'm thinking about the build -a beast options, too. You know, like you could still get Tundra Rhino build -a -beast, off of that. Right, take a cheap uh, Timberwolf, a cheap Dire Wolf. Yeah. Any but... option like that, push more damage this turn with a Dire Frenzy, set yourself up for the Kill Command kill. Like, you, you really aren't winning the board. It doesn't seem like that's working out too well for you. You can also just play a big Muckler. Whoa! No, I'm fine with this. The trade? Yeah. Okay. That's the most scary, and I'm thinking there's still two Tidal Surges and two Healing Rains left in the deck. If Tidal yeah. Surge hit here, I'm sure you drop Viper to nine, he's going to heal 12 of that back. That's fair. And this 8-8 eight, eight is, you know, a bit of problem. Perplexing. Sixteen on board currently, I believe. No, only fourteen, right? Eleven, twelve, fourteen, yes. Health that is for the sake of volcano. Yes. Perplexing. Is that Sis ancestral spirit gonna come down to try and secure this? I imagine it has to, these right? Yeah. These totemic mites gotta stop. <laughs> Viper needs some real cards here. Pasta needs some real beasts. He's just not finding the juice off his Deathstalker Rexar anymore. He got a couple of nice Razor Moors and the like early on. Echo Rush guy. I am always tempted to take Arvis. It me is, too. It is such an impossibility for me to escape because I look at it and I go, oh, just think about how sweet it would be if I dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah. And Viper still got four healing cards left out of the ten cards remaining in deck. And it feels like it's getting point to that desperately needs one scenario. Wow. The one extra attack from Leoc has never been as welcome. But just once again, Viper's got a way to handle this. Finds Tidal Surge. Zentimo had to be used, though. I think that's one of the big one-two punches of healing against a deck like this, is you can do so much work fighting the board. Right. Okay, so I'll take both, uh, I'll take first before Frog, meaning that he does not want to start you get the ones with it, even if it's possible. You get the ones from last turn, mm -hmm. is what it is. Right, right, right. So, he gets back to the I was thinking it was spirit. the spirit for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just got, completely got my cards mixed up. I mean, Viper's feeling pretty darn ahead, I think, given the situation that's panned out. For sure. Decide. It's close, though. Iron Beak Owl. It, it's just, a, it's such a massive hit off the, uh, she's just laughing at the frog. Yeah. It, a silence from Boston's good. Another life drinker effect is good. There are so many good ones in the build -a beast that have high impact here. There's actually, there's so many, oh, there's so many owl lethals. Or actually are there because so many of those options would have to come in the first pick alongside Owl and are therefore impossible just because of the well, way the charge, selections are made. Yeah, Owl, Owl Charge, Owl charge would have done it, but I was thinking like Owl, Timberwolf, Owl, Direwolf, which I don't think are possible because they come in the same stage. Correct. Yeah. Text first, keyword second. Yes. But even still, the Owl just pushing the, the damage from the stealth minion represents the life drinker kill command mm -hmm. on the following turn. Oh, 
gotta go. Just gotta push some damage. That is rush, not charge on the owl. Where everyone's screaming lethal right now in Twitch chat. Wah! Wah! I don't understand. Wah! I know, I mean, I know we have intense cast division right now, and there are two copies of Tidal Surge and two copies of Healing Rain in hand right now. But Bosden has two cards remaining in his deck and is somehow trying to win a long game against Viper. I don't think it's impossible. I just... Lit. Six is a lot. Yes, it is. That's a fireball. I've talked about this. I will do a lot of things for six you damage. You know what Admirable would do for a fireball's worth of damage. Spend four mana and target a card at his opponent's yeah, face. I'd play Mage. Yeah. No one's doing that right now. Well, I guess 10 people in the tournament are doing that right now, including literally Viper, who's in this set with Mage. The point is, he's playing what yet again a control mage in that one. And I feel like Boston, the deviations, I, I, some of them have just been quite surprising to me. Again, the overriding the steady shot as early as he did, uh, the not steady shotting and instead playing the scavenging hyena, the total direction change with the Rexar, the aggressive play with the dire frenzy, and then the deviation from that a turn later. Even the turn where he did switch to Rexar, which I was okay with, he then immediately built a beast as opposed to hero powering first just to push two more damage and then playing the Rexar afterwards. I feel like if you're going to play the Rexar, I like the build a beast okay. a lot of times as well. Uh, if you know if he had had a kill command at that point, no, two damage. I probably wouldn't even play the Rexar at that point. The damage being as deep in the deck as it was, I don't mind the Rexar either, but it's just it was the combination of all of the chain of things leading up to this. I mean, it's been a long day. And that has stealth? Yeah. Didn't realize that. Yep. I, I would have had this in play a while ago. Oh, Stonehill. More Doubles. walls. Double buffed, by the way. Being put up. For Viper. Really? Well, he's got the Eureka. There's only one minion oh, in his hand. Oh, great point, great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good catch. I was just staring at just any other taunt I could play this turn so I don't get hit in the face by any Iron Beak Owl play again on the following turn. But yeah, Eureka is a great catch to get the Alakir out. Boss, I think Boston's just dead. Alakir, the, with the Rockbiter in hand, the Alakir <laughs> represents 10 on that spot. <laughs> I can't handle just drawing a zero mana frog every time. Well, there are three, it's four just, frogs. It's just too funny. But it is really funny. There's no, there's not enough magic in Zoljin, right, to make something happen here. I don't think. There's two kill commands that don't do enough, no matter where they go. Well, there's a heap of secrets as well. Yeah, that's fair. You'd have to have some pretty ideal outcomes, I'd say. Viper looking a lot more comfortable than he has been, I'd say, over the majority course of this game so far. Honk. Not green as far as we can see, but oh. we are spectating from the wrong side of the board. Master's Calls, oh, both Master's Calls before both before the Dire Frenzy. It's actually pretty nice in terms of preventing fatigue for Boston to leave the maximum number of cards remaining in his deck as were possible. But the removal spells are all targeting his own stuff right now. Yeah. Oh! That's not how those are supposed to work! Oh boy. I didn't even realize that was in the deck. I think that was one of my uh, dispassionately red cards at the beginning. <laughs> no wonder I didn't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Allow me to read some cards dispassionately from this <laughs> list. <laughs> Hey, you get Welcome you to the Hearthstone Championship Tour. It's the <laughs> European playoffs. Allow me to dispassionately read some cards <laughs> from this deck list. With as little enthusiasm as I can muster. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think this any... is exactly why I disapprove of haunting visions. This scenario right here is exactly why. Yes. A path Agreed. dimly lit. Okay. Uh, so Viper knows that he, there's the full suite of secrets here. He's seen them all already. He saw them all get recast. He knows exactly what the deal is. So he's just going to hang out for the time being. Let's go into the cryogenic freezing chamber and come out 10 times stronger than you were before. Yeah. And of course, it's you. Uh, the definition of freeze is you miss your next attack. So he throws it there, and then he still, while still having an attack available, so it then immediately unfreezes for his next turn. Yeah. That's a scary Alec here. Is this one approved? By the way, going back to the Hooked Reaver and how it didn't get the Saddle Seal of Approval. The 810 exceeds the threshold, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That Alec here can talk smack at me all at once. <laughs> it can throw all the shade in the universe. Don't talk to me or my Kragwa ever again. Yeah. Hmm. What are I going to do with you? Hurry! Sada, we have gotten some wacky games today. I know. It is beauty. I know. Boss is just going to play the lot. Not ri much room for finesse at this point. He's got a couple of Dire Frenzied Beasts left to play with and this board state, and that is about it. You look perplexed. I, this is lethal a lot, right? It's lethal a lot. Hmm. Alakir attacks the frog. Freezing trap Freezing happens. Freezing trap happens. Kragwa hits the frog. There's no a taunt A bunch of way. irrelevant stuff happens. Yeah. Rockbiter, well, nothing happens the because the board space full. is full. Yes. And then Rockbiter, the Alakir, yes. and you have to get past Wandering Monster. There it is. Yeah. So not quite. Hmm. If you can find some way to attack face first without killing the frog, then you can bypass Wandering Monster that way. But you can't because it has taunt. And even if you earth shocked it, it would die. I must decide. Perplexing. Choosing to freeze the frog here, which can potentially give him cryostasis again. But now he's going to go with the hexes, which will he can then get back again next turn if he wants to. Now he's just going to use the Alakir as a clearing tool, I suppose. You can't attack the second frog. Right. The Venom Strike. Tra Was the Snake Trap or the Venom Track active first? Great question. I mean, Viper's just under pressure now, right? This is a breakthrough for Boston. There's a volcano. He needs a volcano and a card that kills one more 6-6. Six, six. And the game is pretty much done with. I forgot that that card was in the deck as well. There's just so many different weird cards. Yeah. I keep getting little surprises at every turn. Yep. Doesn't look like Viper's under too much pressure to meet. Correct. I was wrong. Very wrong. Viper found a route to literally eliminating all of Boston's resources. There's nothing left. <laughs> what is Viper counting? Just for fun, as an exercise, I'm going to count the remaining five cards in my deck, just so I know what they are. I don't know. I mean... Two of them are healing reigns, I can tell you that much. Oh, this is without the healing reigns! Yes! Oh my gosh! I forgot about that! Yes! I would think that you of all people would have learned about the power of Hagatha by now, but we're finally Whoa! once again sitting here what realizing. What did I even do to deserve that one? You questioned this at the beginning. I said that I needed to have some questions answered. 
It's answered a question very definitively. I am a man of science. I would like evidence presented to me, and it now has been. Okay, look, I don't need your fancy college words, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Them $5 book words. <laughs> a path dimly lit. It's not so dim. You pretty much just put stuff in the way, and that'll, that'll wrap things up. Yeah. Zilliac's no attacks is totally fine. And also very fun to say. Give it a whirl if you haven't. You're talking to me? To anyone. Oh, I see. That's usually how I operate. Anyone with an earshot. <laughs> he doesn't mean earshot of a normal person. He <laughs> means earshot of admirable. Yes. Very distinct difference. Yeah, I'm kind of agreeing with uh, Viper's vague machinations here. This this looked kind of messy to me, but it doesn't really matter a great deal, the it, position that he's in. It looks like it gets the job done. Yeah. And you can, you can see from the state of the board that was left and the fact that the rope was happening that that was not an optimal final turn. You can see from the look on Viper's face that that was not an optimal final turn. You could see from the meaning with his Peanut Shaman deck, and he's going to try to do it one more time in this matchup as well. It's the big control mage taking on the odd rogue of Boston. It sure is. And uh, this is going to be a little bit more hot and heavy from Boston. He was playing a pretty aggressive deck in the previous game, but uh, odd rogue is about as rapid as it gets these days in terms of just ramping up damage as quickly as possible. Cards like Vicious Fledgling, exactly where Boston wants to be with his life because you were uh, extolling the virtues of big control mage earlier by saying that it's you like it because it departs so far from the way that we played Mage for years and years and years, which is Frostbolts and Fireballs and big burn packages and secrets. When you take those Frostbolts and Fireballs out of the deck, early game minions that are enormous threats like Vicious Fledgling get to run wild a little bit. Yeah, and I am a bit concerned about that, uh, you know, for Viper's sake. I think that big spell mage does not do the best against odd rogue, uh, especially if they have the key early threats. I'm, you know, I'm looking specifically at Hench Clan Thug and Vicious Fledgling. In this case, it's a coin Vicious Fledgling. Uh, now, Viper has a lot of taunts in hand to handle that, but I feel like overall, this game gets super tough if Boston picks up any one cost card that isn't deadly poison Correct. on the next turn. Yes. It means that is a Cold Blood Activator. It means this Tar Creeper bites the bullet to this Argent Squire, and it means that the Flappy Bird runs well, and it, that is deadly poison. Well, no, deadly poison works because of the... Ah, I'm dumb again. Deadly Poison Dagger. Dagger deadly as yeah. well, and the, the Squire is one. Yep, he's all good. Yep. Okay, problem. We wait and see on this Fledgling. The fact that it gets to attack face here is just a big deal in oh. its own right. The Wind Fury does come through. The shake of the head has become a bit of a trademark from Viper this series. Comes out one more time as well. buff make the numbers bigger yep when you make the numbers bigger you make their number smaller yeah that doesn't even work kind of does but not really looking at a dagger looking at the first attack of this being squelched But that still leaves one more to go. It is Dragon's Fury time, though, if you're Boston. That's what you are thinking about this turn, whether you have any kind of play that can prevent that from happening, to which I believe the answer is a resounding no. Yeah, you're able to uh, fight off Zilliax, mm -hmm. and you're able to sustain pressure through a Dragon Moss Scorcher. It's not really of any consequence right now. Yeah. The big key one is that Dragon's Fury but there's nothing you can do about it. So you shut your eyes and you make the best play that sets up your Fungal Mancer or your Cold Blood next turn. Probably the Fungal Mancer, which means just playing some minions, one of which is the Tar Creeper. So you play around Zilliac. I think I would hold the Dire Mole in the spot. Okay. You're thinking you might want to be Vile Spining some things uh, in the near future? You know, that's usually what I want to do with Vile Spine is Vile Spine things. Yep. Cold Blood right away, though. Ooh. Seizes four damage, says you better have that Dragon's Fury. Divine and Shield. Divine Shield is there to protect it. That's the money. So now it's Polymorph. That's the lone card in the deck that kills it. Voodoo. Voodoo Doll. I'm sorry, Voodoo Doll as well does it. 
Neither of those are that card, though. Big He's yikes. Dead. He's dead. Dead so. Wait, is it dead so? No, it's not. Eight. Stand collected. It's 13. Is Scratch that dead that. so? He is dead. Forget all these 42 turn Archbishop Benedictus, Peanut Shaman, Fatigue, your opponent beat Deathstalker, Rexar, nonsense games, admirable. That right there, that was a real game of Hearthstone. Woo! His play deck that you kind of have suggested that you think is like the safest bet in the tournament, the deck that you feel like everyone should be banning, is the one that Bosdon is having to force through last, having already lost with it. It's a true story. So now that's the next biggest question. Can it best these last two decks from Viper? Which I will say do feel like they can be pretty big uphill battles. I think the Hybrid Hunter specifically uh, is really one of the marks that Viper's lineup is trying to take advantage of. A lot of players went with Hybrid Hunter because of its impact against other Hunter decks. The Spellstones are so impactful yes. in the mirror match that players have felt like they needed them. Against a, deck, against a lineup like Viper's, his decks are meant to take advantage of turns like Spellstone, where you invest two secrets, you play a Spellstone, they wipe it all away with one card, and suddenly your your hand is left in shambles where you've dumped so many secrets and you've dumped that one important card, and then you're left thinking, what do I do now? Is this a, uh, do you think this is a bluff from Boston, just representing that he might have multiple secrets in hand and is therefore, you know, choosing an optimal option here? Or do you think he was seriously considering 3-2 go on that turn? I think you got to really consider 3-2 go okay. in that spot. I'm probably leaning on the secret, but uh, you know what a 3-2 does? Does it hit for three? That's right. Mm. Okay. And you know what happens if it doesn't die the next turn? Does it hit for three again? Again. They just keep attacking. Meaning it hit for six? Yes. Wow. Two mana, six damage. A lot of that can get healed back over time. I'm pretty sure we've established that you would do quite a lot for six damage. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm playing a Crackling Razor Mall. That's not even that much. You just, you just set it there. In all truth, I do think it's quite a vital tool. I think with uh, Spellstone in hand, I am likely to try to lean towards getting two secrets. And I think that once I pick up the Master's Call, I'm quite satisfied that I've saved the Crackling Razor Maw at that point. Yeah. A lot of one cost minions in the deck that, that pair quite well with Crackling Razor Maw. For sure, yeah. Hmm. Also, just holding them. The first time you stick a minion to the board, you know, being able to Crackling Razor Maw and get some big value. Important. It's also a very reasonable Dire Frenzy target later on if you still have one that you're just hanging around, haven't used. Well, at this point, you got to choose quickly, yeah, but, you know, that changes again. Mm -hmm. You are right about the newer hero cards. They're, they're much more on point oh, than, yeah. than the other ones are. Yeah. No one wants to listen to Base Anduin. <laughs> When did he have, ever have anything interesting to say? Yeah, and when you basic. <laughs> you basic. It's so alarming to me to like find out as someone that's never played World of Warcraft that Anduin is supposed to be like this massive badass in the in the like lore of World of Warcraft where he just looks like the, a giant dweeb in this game. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, the description <laughs> we land on. <laughs> that guy would have his lunch money stolen at school. <laughs> Oh, we really are going away. You really are back in 2009 at this yeah. point. For those of you who have stuck around for the, you know, the 11 and a half hours of broadcast or whatever it was, Sadal had mentioned going back to 2009, which was totally incorrect. That's the opposite of how time works. Spellstone meet Duskbreaker, something that uh, Admirable alluded to several turns ago. You see the look on Boston's face. He was just hoping that against hope that it doesn't happen. There really isn't a lot you can do to increase your chances and just get your Spellstone down as quickly as possible and hope the Duskbreaker isn't there. 
when I compare Duskbreaker and Flanking Strike side by side, it just really seems unfair. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Duskbreaker just hits all of them? All right. I wonder. I think Hunter has enough good cards to be getting on with for now, though. No comment. And Flanking Strike, honestly, is one of them. It is a good card. So yeah, Boston yet again, looking like he is settling in for the long game on what is a very versatile Hunter deck, honestly. Yes, some games you just play a Diamol and then you curve out with the Razormore and your opponent's dead on turn five, like we saw from that Odro game. Uh, but that doesn't happen all too often. Uh, more often than not, you are looking to put together some kind of explosive combo in the mid game to make a big push, be it a scavenging hyena, be it a secret spellstone kind of thing, be it a tundra rhino push. You know, these are all various combinations that can come together based on uh, how you draw throughout the early turns of the game. Yeah, I, I'm not. I feel like I'm not quite sold on the hybrid hunter just yet. Mm -hmm. Like out of the games that I've seen. I'm just really missing some good old two mana card, three mana card, four mana card, and start attacking. Mm -hmm. That just, it puts so much pressure on a lot of decks. So, what kind of hunter would you be bringing? I, I like the I like the more straightforward uh, dire frenzy ones with the master's calls. You just you know, none of that secret nonsense. I like, like the it. Timberwolf stuff. Yeah. Okay. I love the Timberwolves. Every time I know that my opponent has Timberwolf in the deck, I just feel terrified of what Tundra Rhino can do. Yeah. Synergy. Kind of. Sometimes. Viper has been so deliberate in playing around secrets. Yeah. It, he is attacked almost never when there have been secrets in play. Yeah, it's quite interesting to me. It's like he's always trying to avoid the disaster scenario, which is something I feel like I've seen from a lot of players uh, this year who have been quite successful. It, right. It's that rather than... Uh, try to take, you know, small edges where they can see them. Instead, they just mitigate disasters in every single corner. It's interesting because the the secret and counter-secret meta, uh, in terms of, like, the play, has developed so heavily um, that, you know, early on, I think, builds of Secret Hunter, going back even a couple of expansions now, were getting free wins because people were just terrible at playing around various stacks of secrets and knowing what order what was going to go off on and remembering what they've tested for and what they haven't. People generally got a bit better at it and the deck decreased a little bit in win rate and now it got some new tools and it's back with a vengeance. Um, but people are now learning even further that actually if you just don't ever attack against like a pure spell hunter or a real heavily secret based hunter, their decks don't really do anything a great deal of the time. Um, so to kind of play around that eventuality, we're seeing a lot of these hunter lists going down to a single copy of each secret. So you never get in that awful position where your opponent is refusing to proc your secrets and you're just sat with the second copy of those secrets in your oh, hand yeah. when they could be other cards. It, or as I like to call it, the most miserable feeling in the world. The yes. second copy of a secret stuck in my hand because my opponent won't ever activate that secret the most miserable feeling in the world. Yes. It really is. I hate when that happens. That's, honestly, I'm starting to wonder if now that's the reason I hate secrets is because I just picture that scenario happening so often and I'm like, God, that just makes me so mad. I'm really unclear on whether I'm being mocked right you now. You are not. Okay. I'm being very I just, serious. I just thought I'd check. If I, if, I, if I was gonna mock you, I would just mock you. I feel like it's usually safe to ask most of the time. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, if I wanna call you dumb, I'm just gonna call you dumb. That is true. That you would call me that, not that I'm... Yeah, you get it. Yeah. So the game kind of just ping-pongs back and forth. Card that kills a thing and the card that kills a thing back and forth. For the entirety of it. I mean, what, what really breaks this serve? Like, what's the first point that a player is looking for on this one? It's like... Sorry, we've gone we've gone into a ping, extended ping pong analogy here. <laughs> uh, earlier on, Frodan was crossing metaphors with like yo-yoing across the 50-yard line, <laughs> which kind of uh, hit me a little bit close to home. I'm looking at a second primordial Drake. Confident Viper will be too. Yeah. 
So back to the ping pong analogy. <laughs> sure, yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? Well, I just, I'm wondering where this really breaks. I mean, there are so many cards on both sides that just continue to provide the same style of effect. Yes. When does this break? I think uh, it will depend on whether or not Viper draws a Psychic Scream in the next couple of turns. If he does not, I think Boston will find a swingier turn just with nonsense Builder Beast minions that could do unfair things. And then Viper will have to respond to that eventual board dominance with a Psychic Scream play, which he may or may not have by that point. If he doesn't have it, that might be the point where, as you said, the serve is broken and it might just snowball a little bit in favor of Boston. Just everything blows up minions and stays in play. Yep. Didn't quite catch the... I, I'm assuming that's Snowflipper Penguin added to the Hydra in hand. It'd have to be. Yeah. Still at five mana. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big punch with Tundra Rhino. God, I love Crowd Roaster. Boom! Roasted. That is exactly what, what dragons should do. They should breathe fire and eat things. Master's Call back in the mix. Still just a big old suite of secrets over on the left-hand side of Boston's hand. Been hanging out, waiting for Spellstone for a while. It's yeah. just, it's not showing up. Waiting for a Spellstone, waiting for really any reason to motivate Boston to play them, which really Viper is not giving him because why would Boston spend mana playing these secrets right now when Viper has shown consistently throughout multiple matchups that he's just not going to attack into them while they're there until I, he has a perfect clear. The lone one is enough to keep him from attacking. Yeah, exactly. Bloat bat insurance policy? Well, we've seen him take the bloat bat, and last time it it pretty much that to me felt like it was a turning point in that game where he just did not have a significant build of ease. I feel like right now this isn't a time where you can risk playing taking the bloat bat and it coming up short. Well, we shall see, because the poisoners did come up. That's not it. That ain't Falco. Freezing and Snake are going to come down now. Well, freezing seems... That seems a little dangerous to me. Yeah, I'm okay giving my opponent a 9 mana kill one of my guys' minions. I don't think that's a big deal. I don't know. Nine's a lot. That's pretty much what you spent just making this minion, though. Sure. You took your entire turn, you put some secrets into play, and you did... I don't even think Viper's going to blow it up again. He's just going to take it. Mm -hmm. Gimme. Let me change your mind. Is someone injured? That poisonous bloat bat is looking pretty good right now, I'm just saying. <laughs> Dude just would have been taken. <laughs> Well, he wouldn't have played it on that turn. Four or five. Oh, so you're interested in kill commanding your own bloat bat or what have you, or using it with what, I guess? Because it's going to cost six mana, so I guess you know, if you can't flanking strike it, or you can flanking strike it, it'll be at three health. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Well, I'm not comfortable with the situation that Boston's in if I'm Boston. I can tell you that. I am not, no. I expected him to pull ahead over the coming turns, but it was the crowd roaster top deck from Viper that ended up being incredibly swingy. And then uh, Boston just kind of built a slow, do-nothing kind of beast, and Viper said, you know what? I will take spend my turn stealing that slow, do-nothing beast, and now it belongs to me, and you are suffering a huge board deficit. And again, without the Cave Hydras and the Exploding Blowbats of the world, this is something that Hunter just really struggles to come back from. Just getting the secrets loaded. Yep. 
now the dynamic changes a little bit because Boston playing the secrets here, if they do encourage Viper just not to attack, I think Boston's okay with that. He doesn't really want Viper to attack right now because he's got a lot of great attacks he can make if he wants to. Most of them just going into his face. Yeah, this is just... It's very clean play. Like it, I can feel the pressure it's putting on Boston because it's just the board continues to stack up and it gets bigger and it gets bigger until Viper has that crushing attack that he's looking for. Yeah. But this is finally the first turn where it feels like to me Viper does not have an insane thing to do that just continues to build that pressure against Boston. Sure. Ooh. I feel like that attack turn is... It's looming. Behold and marvel as one by one these secrets make Viper's turn better. So has a Cabal Shadow Priest back in hand right now. He has a purpose for this Scorcher. I'm drawing two cards yep. from your North Shire Cleric. Oh my. This, this was bad news for Boston. That just might be too much. Yikes. Scavenging Hyena now hidden behind a Taunted Beast. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what Viper's uh, looking nervous about. In which direction are you directing that whelp? What? How does Boston get out of this? He's getting beat up. Yep. Yeah, Snowflipper Penguins and Bloodfem Raptors are really not going to do it. Boston needs some much spicier stuff. Again, did turn down a poisonous bloatbat, which I, like, I totally hear your argument. Well, turn down the bloatbat with a chance to get poisonous. That is a very important distinction to make, yes. Um, and again, I totally take your point that, you know, he wants to be proactive in this matchup. He does want to be making beasts and sticking boards and being, and being aggressive where he could. He already had a Tundra Rhino in his hand. He already had a big old Zombie Hydra in his hand. Can you play those, though? That was the thing, is that but turning had nothing why to did he, play. Why did he build that thing if he wasn't able to play it? Why did he build a Hydra Snowflipper Penguin that he was just never going to play if, it, if he doesn't consider it a big threat? Well, I think he's going for the, the lifesteal, obviously, on the Hydra, right? Sure. I mean, that's going to fail sometimes. And just when you get trapped in these situations, you know, that, that to me is the importance of that first Build-A-Beast. It's, it's important to lock up things in your hand. I think they have value, but... When you have nothing else to do, you just got to get something. It's why I so often hear players talk about prioritizing hmm. uh, cheap beasts to begin with. It's just sure. to make sure you have stuff to do. Here's, here's my final way I can phrase my distinction. is like you can press the Builder Beast button and get some big idiotic lump of stats, <laughs> right? Very consistently, almost all the time. Yeah, sometimes you end up with me. Continue. You don't get poisonous blow bats all the time. So sacrificing one turn to just put that in the bank and keep it there, safe in the knowledge that next turn you can just take a big old lump of stats because that's what it gives you 90% of the time, I think that's worth it in almost every situation worth as the an risk. insurance policy. Well, I can tell you that the dice have gone south now. And Boston has to figure a way out of this. It just the build the beast has to pull through. I don't think that the cards in his deck are gonna get it done. Agreed. Nope. That is not the juice. Start towards the big dumb idiot, I guess, that you were talking about <laughs> last turn. That's just not what you need anymore. I wonder. Oh, I, I Boston needs a lot, so does, I mean, yeah. let's take some help where we get it. D none of these help. I don't know what he needs. He needs an exorcism. He needs an old. <laughs> he needs an old priest and a young priest, and what he's got is some old priest that's back around new again and is just beating him up. Big idiot.
All right, it's got to be close to time. How much damage is this? The Cleric deals with the traps and everything else goes through. He's got 3, 6, 10, 14, 16, 26 with the two Mind Blasts behind that. I must consider... Well, it's not enough to kill Boston immediately, so... <laughs> no, it is not. So I'm feeling a waiting game. Again, I don't know what Viper's shaking his head at. I, I would be thrilled <laughs> to be in this situation right now. Yeah. This is like when I'm sitting at home playing and my opponent just makes another big, dumb idiot with the Build a Beast. I'm like, woo! I'm just <laughs> fist pumping. I'm like, we're going to win a game! <laughs> This is neat. Kind of gets his damage back here because the explosive trap and the combination of the trade then just buffs up his hyena, pushes more damage. Firetree Witch Doctor, if he picks up a, another source of damage off this, he's very comfortably threatening lethal on the following turn. Already is, but he'll be threatening lethal through removal even. And this is something that's continued to be a, a problem for Viper as well. He's waiting until that rope burns down and just kind of selecting cards and going through motions. And he's having to do it out of order because his turns are taking so long. Yeah. So now he's made all these attacks. He sees Alex Straza and goes, Pff. Yeah. But I'll but, tell you what, the position looks pretty decisive. Yeah, when he finds himself a Holy Smite, as I mentioned, just picking up extra damage, he has this board state. When he has his opponent at 21, it's looking like he has this series locked up two games to two to unless the builder beast comes good one last time you know i'm thinking at this juncture that boston really has to consider zoljin but as far as i'm concerned that's just what does it do it's like a loss at this point just sets a bunch of secrets again and slows down the attack from viper it's really just I delaying the inevitable it. is what it feels like to me right because it's like okay an explosive trap a freezing trap and a wandering monster go up that prevent face attacks you can heal up the 6-2, so there's no great source of damage being lost from these attacks, and then the Norsha Cleric deals with the other ones. You know, it, it really does not do anything massively defensive. Wow. I guess Boston is deciding it's the only play he has. I, it's just, you look at the board, your opponent's finally got aggressive, and you go, I, just, I can't fend this off. You know, the Tar Creeper alone is holding off the position. <laughs> Oh, we'll just wait and see, I guess. He needs some pretty sweet outcomes from these kill commands, and he's getting them so far. That does reduce a lot of damage now with that Freezing Trap and Wandering Monster also putting up defenses, as I mentioned. Flanking Strike whiffs, though. Oh. That was a big outcome, too, because if that had landed on, uh, you know, the, the Scavenging Hyena or even the Cabal Shadow Priest, that then prevents it being healed up out of range of the Explosive Trap hitting face. Now a whole nother heap of trouble. This is just a wacky game. I think the patient play from Viper has, you know, been quite good. It's just been strong the entirety of the way. Mm -hmm. It's just leading for tough positions for him the, the entire time. You know, when this is the way I watch a player play, when they're winning, the game just feels so difficult every single time. <laughs> Not difficult in a way that they don't have the cards necessary to handle the position, just difficult in a way that if you give away one extra resource that you need later on, it spells trouble for you. Like yeah. You have to be picture perfect when it comes to these situations. And so little things that Viper is getting wrong, they're not of great consequence. To me, it's just it's that decision making process where you if you go one step overboard, that's where things really can get tricky. I do want to go back to the, the point that you alluded to at the end of last turn. Viper has got himself in trouble with the rope multiple times, and this is a recurring theme whenever I watch him play. It seems once or twice per tournament minimum, he gets himself in a position where he's scrambling with animations when the rope hits. And particularly in spots like that, where he is drawing a card and yet does not decide to do so until a good 30 to 40 seconds into his turn. When you draw that card, you then have to reevaluate decisions based on that card that you draw. It can change so much about your turn.
Yeah. So I think if you're going to draw a card in a turn, you have to make that decision quicker. Here we go again. There's a rope, and there's still eight of his ten mana left available to him. I think it's just going to be a scream this turn, yeah. which is no harm, no foul. But if he had to make a more complex uh, mechanical play there, we might have again seen that scramble that we saw on the previous turn. He's just operating a little bit too slowly at the moment. And honestly, I'm, I'm curious if this can get him in trouble. Now I'm looking at just, you know, turn after turn of redevelopment from Boston is pressure. And he's got back a two damage hero power at this point. Yes. Tundra Rhino, Bitter Tide Hydra is still in hand. He's gonna That's it. a great point. I, I think this I think this could be some real trouble for Viper. And, you know, a lot of this is just brought by the fact that Zuljin is just such a massively powerful thing to do that disrupts combat. Yeah. It was hard for Viper to really push through any significant damage in that turn. And it wasn't a position where he was afforded the luxury of just waiting. You know, Boston got a seven minion board. And I beg the question of, you know, why build this this big Hydra? This uh, snow, flipper, uh, snow Flipper Penguin Hydra if you weren't going to play it. Maybe this was the plan all along. He's just been potentially using it as charge damage alongside that Tundra Rhino that he has also been holding on to for an awfully long time. Oh, oh Piggy. Yeah, that one goes to market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Picking up four damage. None of these piggies are staying at home, I can tell you that yeah. much. This Dustbreaker looks like it's got some farming of its own to do. Let's go. Eleven from Tundra Rhino and Bitter Tide Hydra. So Boston does not have too much <gasps> of a length to go. Oh, that's two scavenging hyenas with a Tundra Rhino. That's one, two, three, four. That's eight. That's only that's the, basically the same thing as the Hydra. It's actually a little bit less right now. Yes. So I'm thinking it's the stealth zombiest, and then push. But you get yourself in your own trouble that way against burn damage. But right yep. now, Boston is one out of range out of the double mind blast holy smite that Viper has in hand. Oh, geez, you're right, yeah. So the stealth. I hadn't been looking at that. The stealth minion plus the hero power face actually represents the damage necessary for Boston to end the game on the following turn. Yes, it does. But I'm looking at Shadowy Branduin in hand as well. That throws out that in upheaval. If you spend eight mana this turn not developing because your opponent has a tempo swing. That is not a fun also, scenario. Whoa, having just looked down, there are three cards remaining in Viper's deck. I think you have to potentially give him credit for Shadowy Banduin being in hand now. It's yeah. so unlikely that it's not there. And yeah, I think playing the Stealth Zombiest is it's, it's, it's just a hard concede to Shadowy Banduin at this point, I think. So instead, it's the fight for board? Yes. Triple trade. Quadruple. It only goes up to eight anyway. It must be going face. No! Wow! Again, so similar to what we saw in the previous game with Hunter. So much respect being given. If he goes face here, I guess that plays into the same argument that we were just making about the Shadowy Bandwin, right? He gets his eight damage, and that's the difference. Well, yeah, he gets, he gets his eight, eight damage. damage. But the other thing, too, is that the, the zombies won't connect at that point very often. The Shadowy Brandon comes down, blows up the Scavenging Hyena, and then the Twilight Drake and the Hero Power clear off the Tundra on it. You're yes, stranded with exactly. the Beast in hand. Yep. Oh my gosh, this game is just... I, I get, it's so stressful for me, I'm just watching it. I can only imagine what the players are going through in these situations where every single turn feels like you're on the Let brink of disaster. The Twilight Accolade now rips the eight attack away from the Scavenging Hyena. <laughs> Oh, not even that. You can trigger the trap with it. It's Venom Strike. Viper knew that too as well, yes. right? He knows yeah, so he just picked up two damage. Yeah. He just stole it and wanted to keep it as opposed to trade it. Out of all the attacks that have been possible this game to push damage, it is pretty annoying to me that a 2-1 Tundra Rhino is the one that really gets it done. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's perfectly legitimate, right? He traded a Holy Smite, which is two damage, and basically always two damage, like plus minus a Shadow Reaper and win refresh ping, and he traded it for two damage plus a recurring minion. I'm just annoyed. Yeah. There's been so much stuff on board. That That's the one that gets through. And didn't, That's yeah. the one that gets through. Yeah. No, I hear you. 
That does it. Mind blast. Mind blast. Two to two. If there was any surprise, we are going to go the distance one more time. And we have got a control mage in our future for Bosden to run this hunter into. And uh, Bosden now fake one deck games. left, the big they spell can. mage in this one. Game five, round five, an important round for both of these players. And an important mulligan for Bosden. And there is that Dire Mole of which I spoke earlier, but there is also the Spellstone. And I think, honestly, this deck is so tricky to mulligan for, in a uh, mulligan with, in so many different matchups, because you end up starting with a hand that's just a little bit split like this, right? It's why I think this deck does fit the kind of hybrid moniker, because you, you just end up with just different portions of your deck. Like Dire Mole, you want to mullig mulligan every other card so you can draw Razor more. But are you mulligan away a Spellstone? No, it's one of the best cards in your deck. But if you're keeping Spellstone, you want to mulligan every other card away for secrets. That's I'm kind of goofy. I'm confused just listening. <laughs> That's probably the way to go. Seems right. Ooh, there is that Dire Frenzy. Can represent a lot of damage early Viper's on. hand is not good. Ooh, it's slow. It is not good. Nope. That is, as of yet, oh boy. not a crackling razor more, though. That card's good. But the rest of this is still just quite clunky and slow. I am quite worried for Viper in this situation. Play it. Yep. <laughs> Biggest minion, go face. And anything Viper does, the threat of flanking strike. Or Dire Frenzy. Or Dire Frenzy. It's very real. Or Spring Paws. Let the pain speak to me. Acolyte of Pain is better against Spring Paw, and it's the only thing that really makes a difference. So I kind of agree with this choice. And it helps him cycle through to his uh, Dragon's Fury that it looks like he's going to need potentially sooner rather than later. Boston's off to a blistering start here. Dragon's yes. Fury changes the landscape, though. I mean, this hand just went from looking miserable to suddenly like, ah, okay, we got the Dragon's Fury. And that's that's part of the reason I think Viper goes to the Acolyte of Pain in this situation, just knows that, yeah, sure, 3-3 three, three does an okay job contesting the board, but you need to draw into the deck. I was about to say, I think I'd, I'd like to see a Dire Frenzy here, but the, does, does the Razor more change it enough? What are you Razor more? A hyena, of course. Yes. What are you looking for? Divine Shield? Divine Shield. Because you're thinking actively about the Dragon's Fury turn. That's yes. always like the first checkpoint, I feel like, against a mage deck. Yeah. I think, so you can Dire Frenzy, and that plays around uh, Zilliax as an option. It also partially plays around Dragon's Fury the time that the Polymorph gets flipped over. Sure, yeah. I guess that's reasonable. It also gives you Most three more two-mana 5-5 five, five scavenging hyenas in your deck. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, you are dying to a Dragon's Fury if it comes down there. And most of the time, it turns out, is today. Boston's going to lose his first push. Wow. Woo! And that, that's the third Scavenging Hyena, which means that one is a 5-5. Five five. Yes. Don't have to check that. However, I'm looking at the Spellstone and going, you know what, two three threes just doesn't seem that bad right now. I can see it. Potentially lines up badly into Zilliax. Like, that's about it. Tar Creeper's pretty ugly. Yeah. I think you're probably a little bit happier maybe using your Razor Board. No. Stonehill Defender's pretty tough. That situation. There are a lot of cards I think that Viper just responds to pretty well with it. You know, even just rolling into a Meteor. I mean. Yeah. No, you have a finite know. amount of resources in Viper's deck to do that. But, you know, that's pretty much the entire deck is blow stuff up or is big minion. Right. I think pretty much all your turns this turn suck against Meteor, though, unless I get this gets Divine Shield. Oh, boy. There it is. Well, Polymorph's a wait. It is. Divine Shield is just so premium in this matchup, though. I mean, we we very uh, brashly just said, you know, take the stats, make it bigger in most of the other matchups that we saw. But Control Mage is just a different animal because it's hard to build a minion that gets outside of what their removal can do. Yeah, but most of their removal is just one big shock yes. source of damage. So a Divine Shield can really make a mess of that plan. Not the 
this position is Viper. I think the Ziliax is providing some good breathing room here. Uh-oh. Well, now the draw is starting to look disjointed. That's a whiff. All right. I'm thinking that two damage button needs to start doing some work. If, you, if Boston continues to just AOE check Viper, I can tell you what, this is the way to do it because the Spellstone, like it just ends up failing in this position. I think I think Boston has to just play these cards and hope. You need to get play a board enough that Viper can AOE it. But this way, maybe you draw a secret, you get three wolves out of your Spellstone instead. But right now, the plan in my, if I'm in Boston's shoes, is keep clicking the button. Surprised that Viper even ends up meteoring that board because I take your point that Bosden was trying to force some kind of removal uh, without using his Spellstone, which he succeeded in doing. But honestly, I feel like Viper was just fine to just like Zilliax that turn. I definitely think Zilliax had a lot of merit. I am, a, I am, I'm not surprised by the Meteor. I was surprised at how hasty the Meteor was it's in comparison to what he's done. He's played all day. But uh, and this match, it certainly feels that way. I mean, it's just, it's pretty straightforward a lot of times. Big Spell Mage, uh, you know, oftentimes it's about spending the more expensive cards in your hand that could do a pretty similar effect to what the rest of your cards are going to do as well. Okay. The difference is there's still 5-5 five, five Scavenging Hyenas in Boston's deck. That's one of the reasons that I'm somewhat in favor of saving the Meteor is because you still have those big yeah. cards to deal with. For sure. I'm going to keep clicking this button, though. I think this is something that Boston has foregone in some of the other series, is just attention to that repetitive damage over and over again. But this game, his hand feels more forced into it than it had in the previous games. And there is a 5-5 Scavenging Hyena without a appropriate answer right now. He can deal with it, but Dragon's Fury is not what I would call an appro appropriate response to this situation. Uh, it's good enough. Yeah, I would. I'm fearing the heck out of that thing. Oh, for sure, in that spot, like you, you have to. But I'm just saying, he could have still had a meteor remaining and had the Ziliax in play and have more health and been contesting the board with minions. It just seems like a stronger line. Yeah, and then for Boston, you know, it's that it's that ever present question as well of, you know, wh which comes first, the Zuljan or the Rexar? Yes, that, that's supposed to be a chicken and the egg thing. I, I yeah, I get it. Well, I'm just, it just, it felt like I'm not sure which is which or why that's <laughs> even generally a good thing to have done. Uh, Zoljin came first. Sure. Just not alphabetically. Or chronologically. Which I feel Zoljin's pain on that one. Or by any meaning of the word at all, really. Look, again, if you're just going to pay attention to definitions and words and stuff, this isn't going to work. Quickly. While we're making light of the situation, Bosden is far more seriously considering the dilemma in front of him. It's it's bad. Because, again, like this is a, a position that he's been forced to play out every now and again where he's Deathstalk or Rexar because his hand had no value and he needed to do things. But then he gets forced into a position where he has to Zoljin later in the game, so he loses the infinite value of the Rexar hero power. It's, it's a spot that we've seen people forced into on multiple occasions, and you're generally not happy about it. And that was Bosden's real um, machinations that turn. He's just trying to figure out whether he can afford to do that, whether he needs to get juice out of this Zoljin first before going into Rexar mode. Before all that, just can he set up lethal with this Tundra Rhino that he has in hand? Yeah, and you know, also on Viper's side, two Dragon's Furies Meteor in the pool right now. I mean, Dragon Caller Alana is making three five fives yeah. at the same time. So I feel like as soon as Viper gets a lead, you know, he's free to just play that and threaten to deal massive damage on the other side. Right. This is not a breakthrough turn for Boston right now. And if you play this Rexar this turn to handle things, it means that Zuljin's sticking in hand for quite some time. The eternal hunt has begun. It also means a turn of extremely little tempo from the Hunter and a free turn for Viper to do essentially whatever he likes on the backswing. And he has some nice, juicy choices. 
pretty much two of the biggest ones. You know, I would say Jaina is really the only thing that could make this decision a bit more difficult for him. I no, I take that actually makes it a lot easier for him. Excuse me. If he gets Jaina, you slam the Jaina. But Drawing Frost Lich Jaina has never made any situation <laughs> more difficult in history. Wash out your mouth, sir. Button being pressed. And Scale hide. I'm thinking a big one here is fine because you just don't have anything else in hand to do. Scale hide. <laughs> It's always scale hide, let's be honest. Yep. It's just the one you take. So, Dragon Caller, Lick King. You want to go double five? I'm thinking mm. double five here is pretty <laughs> good. Admiral's just now channeling through me. He just didn't even talk, just pointed well, at Well, I didn't know if you were going to, like, lead into it with a <laughs> statement or, like, just point it out or just go straight for the throat. Like, I didn't, uh -huh. know, I didn't I just didn't know how you were going to approach the thing. So explain the double five line to me. Why, I, why is it stronger than summoning a bunch of five fives or an eight eight taunt? The reason I like uh, the, the Dragon Ball and the Rotten Apple Bow is you get to trade into the three two here. You get to jam these two fives down, which are relatively weak cards. And then once these present a challenge to your opponent, you get to follow up with the big thing. So you test your opponent with these two reasonably sized minions and then figure out which one of these is going to stick to the board. Okay. If he just goes with just Lich King or just Dragon Caller Alana in this situation, the Dragon Caller Alana is definitely the better of the two just because it's more stuff at once. The Lich King is the weaker of the two because you can get punished by opposing build a beast in that situation. So if the plan is the Lich King, I think you want to lead with the two fives before, but what do I know? It all sounded great. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I've had the luxury of not having to play five grueling rounds of Hearthstone today. Yeah. And also, I, I don't have the luxury of being Viper, who's going to the World Championships. Yeah. And has had a phenomenal year for himself. And is an incredibly experienced Control Mage player yes. on top of all of that. I've played a lot of Control Mage, but I have not played as much as Viper has. But Glitch King's dead now. Scale high. That's not necessarily a bad thing the Lich King's dead, though. I mean, your opponent just used a valuable tool, and they didn't use Build-A-Beast on that, on that prior turn. So Lich King, in effect, also took out one future Build-A-Beast in that situation. Yeah, no, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, Viper has clearly been about, you know, resource advantage at pretty much every single turn of every single game that we've seen so far. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Medivh. <laughs> it's nice to receive some validation from somewhere. But Dave, you're all right in my book. Picking up the ooze value here. So this is now something similar to what you were suggesting previously, right? Where he goes with the ooze instead, because why not get value out of it, I guess? But yeah, spreading threats just a little bit wider. Uh, no 3-1 on board that he would be challenging otherwise with the Scorcher, but he now sets that up for the following turn. So 5-5 five, five, Hyena uh, joins the party as well. He's still just so close. Like, what's the biggest thing he can build for three mana to, like, punch through a taunt and allow the Scavenging Hyena to charge face? Right, like, for ten mana, you could go Tundra Rhino, Scavenging Hyena, plus X Build a Beast, and the X Build a Beast kills a taunt and dies, therefore buffing the Hyena and pushing more damage through. I, that's, what, that's what I'm always what's thinking about. the biggest like, thing? Stealth is always one of the ones that comes to stealth my mind. Stealth works too, yeah. Uh, but stealth is, like, often attached to, to Jungle Panther, so mm -hmm. you're looking at three plus X. Uh, charge also works in a lot of scenarios as well, depending on what you took. Um, so all of that put together, you know, just then there's nothing else left in hand to do. I'm thinking grab the five and I'm thinking grab a three and call that a day. The four and the six works as well, though. You know, you can save the... the why well, can't Stampeding Kodo as the front half of that build a beast? You can save that for when your opponent artificers you want to turn to be able to push back against that. That's often, to me, I've found one of the most annoying things when I'm playing against uh, Mage is that I run into a situation where they artificer clear my board and then I'm just left with nothing to do. Did someone and say artificer clear my board? Whoa. Yes, I mean, this is like a common situation I feel like I run into against Mage where then I'm left with no way to answer this artificer efficiently. And I think that's what this charge uh, pickup is for. That's it. 
The debate on how to get max damage out of the Tundra Rhino is now pretty much irrelevant. It was used on the previous turn just to try and take the board back. It's something that we've seen Boston do consistently, time after time, game after game with this deck. That's really another point it's I keep to bring fighting out. board. I keep always. fighting board. He just always does it. Yeah. And I don't think that's a bad plan, but I think that there are superior plans, and I often think that damage is a superior plan. I mean, you, you're playing Hunter, and you have ways to charge. Like, that Tundra Rhino fought for some board position. I'm not too keen on putting five mana two fives in my deck to fight for board position. I'm, I'm totally with you. In the meantime, Boston's made himself a stealth poisonous cave hydra. Pretty good. Which is the kind of defensive beast he was really lacking in the previous game against the, the Dragon Priest, the kind of beast that he turned down in the form of the blowback. I think here it's just a decent amount of stats as well as being able to take care of any board state that comes down on the following turn. It's left up Artificer for a turn though. No punish available. Dragon Caller Alana looks a lot worse into a poisonous cave hydra. <laughs> I was trying to think of any way to justify army, and I immediately scrolled to the I, bottom I of the really deck list. I really to do that too. And yeah. I went, oh yeah, Frostless Jaina, that's yeah. the... Okay, yeah, I can't use I was, that one. I was like, let's just discard some cards that aren't Frostless Jaina <laughs> and just draw it. It'll be fine. Th those are the kinds of traps you have to avoid in tournaments when you've been playing for a long time and you're like, ah, I'm just going to play this big card. Yeah. Th that's just, it'll lose you games doing that. Like, you have to be able to maintain this focus. And my hat's off to players who can maintain the kind of patience uh, that they they demonstrate in these situations. It's it's tough to do. Sorcerer first, drawing second, which is perfectly understandable in this spot as to not deal the damage to his Raven Familiar. There was a lot of things to do uh, that turn, a lot of things to consider that turn. Uh, the sequencing of those two cards, as mentioned, then also the positioning, because this Cave Hydra has a cleave effect, as in attacking a minion and the two adjacent minions, which means that uh, which minion you place in between which two others makes a huge impact on what it's going to take out with the poisonous effect. Thinking one of those big dumb piles of stats turns. Usually is. As you so eloquently put it. More often than not. Ooh, little dumb pile of stats. Ooh. Medium dumb pile of stats. Okay. As we know, medium boys go in the middle. I wonder. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to figure out what this means, and I'm just like... It was just like brain delay where it was like, we'll say that to him then, stupid. I don't know what that means. I really don't. I don't think it means anything. back with you that is I, a huge I, I, draw I, I did break for a second <laughs> you have tears in your eyes i actually do yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh it's so beautiful do not fear power fear those who wield it poison is going to make some easy work of this thanks to the adjacency that the water elemental has to this uh generic three two the Jaina draw could still end up being the final nail in the coffin here for Boston. Ooh, Cave Hydra Echo. Whatever the first minion was, Echo. I love Ooh. the Echo minions. They just feel good. They do. I agree. The problem here is that Boston has made his one big AoE beast that you're kind of entitled to to get over a long game, and he's used it already. And now Viper is going to store up and save up for this big Alana and try and use it to potentially blow out the game. And Boston's not really going to have much of an answer to it. Oh. 
Senku's hate. Use your words, mm. I, d I don't... I, d I just... I feel like Boston has built things that seem... It seems like they're lost in purpose, almost. Mm. Poisonous Hydra number two. Nothing wrong with Poisonous Hydra. That's a good minion. Absolutely not. Raven Familiar can go fishing here, and there is so much gas remaining. Blizzard will do the job quite nicely. Net yourself a water elemental while you're at it. Call it a day! Can't silence off a freeze, but that silences off the rest of the Cave Hydra's effects as well. Yeah. And how much you really need that little bit piece of damage right now when uh, Frostless Jainer is providing near infinite healing over the next several turns. It's another Echo as well available. Is that, that's something I feel like, you know, in, the, in a matchup like this, Boston needs to be taking advantage of minions that are two things for one thing. This could have been back-to-back -back Echo minions that are forcing AoE cards, often by themselves. Yeah. Viper eventually runs out of those. It takes a long time, but eventually runs out of them. Viper back playing the counting game again. I've seen this multiple times as we've developed towards ends of games. At one point, he was just counting something in a 100% one game. I don't know what that was all about. This one a little bit closer, coming down to the wire. Boston still has plenty of gas left in beasts, but he's... He's going to have to formulate some kind of game plan for this Dragon Caller Alana when it eventually comes down. If he can't find some kind of answer, either to hold in hand or to keep preloaded on the board, then Viper's going to be able to run away with it. Just another big spell to add to the mix. Yep. Just poke the Hydra Flame Strike ping. Voodoo Doll, the Hydra, freeze the Dire Wolf, trade into the 4-2. Like, everything is good. The reason the reason I like the Flame Strike is just again build to that Alana. I think that is like the plan sure. right now. Just keep yeah, making that progress. It is an expenditure, but it build towards it builds towards a process as well. Voodoo Doll and Polymorph this turn if you really wanted to. I think the Polymorph is also superior uh, due to the nature of untargetability. And you know, Rex Army. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh! Oh, he went face! Someone went face! Damage was dealt! Hearthstone is back! Woo! <laughs> He's at 31 and we're celebrating. Damage! <laughs> it can't be dealt! You don't have to wait until they start drawing the fatigue cards. <sighs> I guess Ravasaur Run is where we're starting. Well, there's plenty of medium sized things in hand, so at this point, supplement with cheap things. That's my thought. Yeah, I can see that. I'll go one way or the other. Like, I would try and take something cheap or something enormous. Which tracks to follow Senku's hate? Boston deep in the tank on this one, though. Wow. Hey, you're staring down two water elementals. You know your Dire Wolf's going away. It's not easy. Big Ravisaur run. Stealth. Preventing the water elemental. Alana. And Viper says it's time. He's that... keeping track. He knows there is, I believe, only one zombie beast in hand that can be any kind of answer to this. And he says, I'm stable enough now, healing up to 30 again to be able to now make this push. Just make a whole bunch of five fives and say, deal with it, Sunny Jim. I don't know who Sunny Jim is, but I don't think he's helping Boston right now. He definitely isn't. I, I, don't, 
I don't know how Boston wins from this spot. Well, those are three cards that are not exploding blowback. I, would the blowback even get there? How would the like? What would you need with the blowback? Taunt poisonous it has to be taunt poisonous. Mm -hmm. uh, poison rush. Cost too much mana. It's five, isn't it? Five plus four. Plus four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Instead, it's the desperation jeweled macaw. Mm -hmm. You know, desperate times. Yep. So this now means a measly, what, 16 damage plus the ping is going face this turn through that explosive trap. But there is just a juicy 2 1 on the board, ready to be pinged off. There is a 7 2 that can get back, traded by a 3 1. Time like, Boston has way. made a play that's kept him alive, but he is very much on life support right now. Big yikes. And all of those horrible sounding things that I just described have now happened to Boston, and his face reflects it. A 3-1 did trade with his 7-2. His 2-1 did magically turn into a 3-6 lifesteal freezy thing for his opponent. And he's looking pretty dead. I, the old tempo artificer, I think, might say it up here. <laughs> yeah? Hey, we've seen Super Collider go face lethal already today. Tempo artificer is nothing. There's still one thing left. Taunt poisonous bloat bat. It still is enough to stay alive. Yeah. Button and hope. I wonder. There just hasn't really been any secrets played. Here comes a big ass. We're about to find out if that's true. There's the explosive that we just saw. Ooh. King Strike does put the water elemental into the range of the explosive trap now. Still 16 on board though. Snakes do nothing. Master's Call cool is doing nothing. Lightning Strike number two. Ooh. That doesn't prevent any extra damage. The explosive trap would take care of that. Yeah. Oh, Spring Ball! It's a 5 3 down to a 5 2. And now Boston, technically, very much alive. I really want to stress technically. Yep. Technically alive is the best kind of alive. I very disagree with that. Don't you know that that's explosive trap? Yeah. He just wants to push the damage and he's going to clear the board anyway with flame strike, so why not? Ah, I was thinking freeze up board to just really annoy my opponent. <laughs> <laughs> I flame mean, strike works. I mean, this is fine. I definitely believe you're a control mage player now. That is the mentality <laughs> checks out. <laughs> can make a play that wins the game, but it doesn't annoy my opponent as much as this line. Well, so let's do this instead. Mm, this gonna oh yeah, it is. <laughs> You're pretty dead. Stays alive. Kill commands a 3 4, trades into the 3 1. Hero power can take care of the 3 2. It's just, how do you win? We out here living, boys.
chooses to go with the Subject Nine line instead, which gets him Freezing Trap and Wandering Monster. Ah, which this is superior. It, it does. Oh no, he go, okay, so he goes Freezing Trap and Ping instead of Freezing Trap and Wandering Monster. So yeah, the cost of dealing, using a kill command and dealing with one of the minions, he just leaves it to get frozen instead. It's a formality, really. Many of the things that have happened today have been formalities, <laughs> and we have been forced to talk about them anyway, for it is our job. Yes. But now, sir, you are at one. None of the cards in your hand gain you health. And so... <laughs> What is Boston doing? <laughs> I'm just looking at the camera at this point, and it's like realization is setting in where you're like, I just sat here this long to get beaten by these dumb water elementals. Now it's good. Free Does he just have a random lifesteal rushed minion in his deck that he's about to no. draw? No, he I is not. Never forget. Never forget. And it's a marathon, but we have got there in the end. Viper 